The Finance Committee will come to order. And colleagues, this is nominations week here in the Senate Finance Committee. This is the second of three nomination hearings. We're very pleased to be able to welcome Attorney General Javier Becerra, President Biden's nominee, to lead the Department of Health and Human Services. With the pandemic raging, so many Americans are struggling to get by, and our health care system is strained to the max. There may not be a higher stakes job in the executive branch outside the presidency. Attorney General Becerra brings more than two decades of experience in the Congress. He was a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee, which overlaps with this committee on many important health issues. He was closely involved in major accomplishments on health care, including the Affordable Care Act. For four years, he's led the second largest Department of Justice in America, overseeing thousands of employees and a billion dollar budget. Anybody who discounts the experience of leading a California agency that large and influential <coughs> to the fifth largest economy in the world is straining awfully hard to find something to critique. The Attorney General defended the Affordable Care Act from absurd and dangerous far-right attacks. When the pandemic hit, he went to bat for Californians by increasing access and affordability for COVID treatments, protecting workers from exposure, and securing key safeguards for frontline healthcare workers. Having started my career in legal aid for senior citizens, as the co-founder of the Oregon Great Panthers, I appreciate the Attorney General got his start in legal aid for the less fortunate. This is a nominee with the right policy experience, the right leadership experience, and the right experience fighting for people without power. That's exactly what's needed at the Department of Health and Human Services after four years of management that took America in the wrong direction. Now, in this committee, a special focus of our work is going to be tackling inequality in every form. In America, inequality is a killer. If you didn't believe it before the pandemic, there can be no questioning it today. People of modest means, people targeted by discrimination, people marginalized in society, they're the Americans who suffered disproportionately in the pandemic. That's because they were vulnerable, vulnerable before the pandemic and federal policies didn't do enough to protect them. I'll take through a few examples. First, Americans are getting clobbered every time they walk up to the pharmacy window to pick up their prescription drugs. In a country as wealthy as ours, it is shameful that you still hear about people rationing their own medicine and suffering terrible consequences because they can't afford their medicine. Second, the pandemic has proven there needs to be a new focus on mental health in America. With so many lives lost and so many people out of work, it shouldn't be a surprise that people in Oregon and across the country are struggling when it comes to mental health care. Compared to physical health care issues, mental health has gotten short shrift for far too long. Now the law says they're equally important, but I'll tell you that's often not the way it's handled in the real world. That needs to be changed. We're gonna talk some more about it this afternoon. Third, the pandemic has shined a spotlight on many long running disparities in healthcare in the country, many of them that stretch back generations. One of them is maternal healthcare. The American people want this to be a pro-family nation. It's totally unacceptable that pregnancy and childbirth in the postpartum period are so dangerous to American women, particularly when you compare our country to wealthy nations. This is especially serious for black and Native American women 
and it's getting worse as the years go by. In fact, here's a shocking statistic. Women today are more likely to die in childbirth than their mothers were a generation ago. Addressing this crisis goes hand in hand with the need to expand and improve women's health care overall since the last four years have been a women's health nightmare. Now, I'm looking forward to working with the Attorney General and the Biden administration on these issues and more. It's been a difficult four years for too many vulnerable Americans who struggle to pay for medicine and secure health care. If AG Becerra and his team start every day actually focusing on expanding health care and improving health services instead of limiting them, they'll already be doing better than the last administration. This is a nominee who is highly qualified. He's got a valuable range of experience that will help him succeed in this job. <clears throat> and this is a historic nomination because the Attorney General would be the first Latino Secretary of Health and Human Services. Finally, I want to congratulate him on a, a late breaking development. Uh, today, he won in federal court defending California's net neutrality law. And I see the chair of the Commerce Committee who's done so much on that issue. And we're looking forward uh, to seeing the Attorney General score more wins for the American people. With that, let me uh, recognize our friend, uh, the ranking member, Senator Crapo, for his opener. Thank you very much, Senator Wyden. Welcome, Attorney General Becerra. The Department of Human Health and Services is a sprawling department with over 80,000 employees and responsibility for over $1 trillion in annual spending. HHS and its agencies directly affect everyday life, including running programs that provide health care coverage to nearly 150 million people. The HHS Secretary will shape Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare, and many other important programs in the Finance Committee's jurisdiction. These responsibilities are formidable in normal times, but the COVID-19 pandemic has made the HHS mission even more critical as these programs will play a key role in the pandemic response. This hearing is important for us to understand how Attorney General Becerra would carry out these monumental responsibilities. A few weeks ago, I outlined several issues in the healthcare space where I intend to focus my efforts as ranking member including fostering innovation to improve patient care and making our health care system more efficient. The COVID-19 pandemic has threatened Americans' physical and economic health, but it has also reinforced the value of innovation and provided an opportunity to test changes that foster it. HHS has used its authority under the public health emergency to waive numerous requirements to ensure Medicare beneficiaries, beneficiaries and other patients receive care during the pandemic. Patients have benefited from expanded access to telehealth and expedited approval of COVID-19 vaccines, diagnostics, and treatment. Going forward, Medicare and Medicaid patients should have the same access to those innovative items and services as those with commercial insurance. We must carefully evaluate our response to the pandemic and implement appropriate reforms based on the lessons we've learned. HHS should partner with this committee in that effort. Another long-term priority for many on this committee is to finally address Medicare's looming financial problems. Medicare's financial stability was a key issue discussed by the bipartisan Bull Simpson Commission on which I served with Attorney General Becerra a decade ago. Although the Commission's proposal did not reach the required supermajority of 14 out of 18 votes for adoption, it did produce a constructive bipartisan blueprint to reform and secure our entitlement programs. Medicare's finances remain unsettled, with the Medicare trustees currently projecting that the hospital insurance trust fund will go broke in 2026 and unforeseen circumstances could move the insolvency date even closer. The new administration should work with Congress in a bipartisan way to ensure that Medicare is able to serve current and future beneficiaries. In yesterday's hearing before the HELP Committee, many of my colleagues raised concerns about the enforcement of California's restrictive actions related to COVID-19, including the ban on indoor religious services that was rejected by the Supreme Court. 
They also raised questions about challenges to HHS's authority to provide a conscience exemption from the Obamacare contraception coverage mandate. A coalition of pro-life Americans sent a letter to all senators in opposition to the nomination of Javier Becerra to be Secretary of Health and Human Services. And, Mr. Chairman, I ask that that letter be included as a part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Nearly a year ago, the committee worked together to expand unemployment compensation in response to the economic devastation caused to workers by shutdowns. As time has passed, there has been substantial reporting of fraud perpetrated against California's unemployment insurance program. Fraudsters, including international criminal organizations, have siphoned off perhaps more than $11 billion. That raises questions regarding what specific steps were taken to combat unemployment fraud and when those steps were taken. Finally, uh, Attorney General Becerra, you have long been an advocate for moving all Americans to a government-run Medicare for All plan, raising concerns with me that your policy preferences could undermine the Medicare programs that rely on private insurance. You and I have talked about this privately, and I will discuss it further with you during the question period. I strongly support private insurance so patients can choose the coverage option that best meets their need. The popular Medicare Advantage program that covers 24 million beneficiaries must be allowed to continue to thrive. And the successful Medicare Part D program must continue to serve its 47 million enrollees without government interference. The number of issues I've raised indicate the scope and importance of this position. And I look forward to hearing your testimony and your responses to questions. Thank you. I, I thank my uh, colleague, and we're going to have a big debate on that, but uh, uh, the Department of Labor, of course, handles unemployment, and uh, we're going to talk through all of these issues, I'm, I'm sure. Now, uh, we've got uh, the senior senator from California, Senator Feinstein, who is here for an introduction uh, of uh, the nominee, and we welcome her for her comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Ranking Member uh, Crapo, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee to introduce California's Attorney General, Javier Becerra, as President Biden's nominee to be Secretary of Health and Human Services. I am so proud to have known this man for, as both a friend and a colleague. He spent decades serving our state currently as the state's attorney general and previously as a 12-term congressman from Los Angeles. Mr. Becerra was the first in his family to receive a four-year college degree, earning his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from a university we share, that's Stanford, and later his JD from Stanford Law School. As a member of the House of Representatives, he was a strong advocate for the health care of his constituents, and he fought to make the Affordable Care Act law. As California's Attorney General, he's been a staunch defender of the Affordable Care Act, leading 20 states and the District of Columbia in defense of the act before the Supreme Court. As part of his focus on protecting the health of Americans, Mr. Becerra worked with Nebraska Attorney General Doug Peterson a Republican, to lead a bipartisan coalition of 43 attorneys general to reduce youth exposure to tobacco products like e-cigarettes, which we've all become very concerned about and which continue to pose significant health risks to children. He has also worked on a bipartisan basis with multi-state coalitions of attorneys general on other health priorities that align with the work of this committee, which includes increasing access to COVID-19 treatments, as well as addressing the opioid epidemic and the considerable harm it has caused to families. As our state's Attorney General, Becerra led the nation's second largest Department of Justice, behind only the U.S. Department of Justice. So he is skilled and um, just extraordinarily good. As secretary, 
He will lead the nation's top health agency charged with enhancing the health and well-being of all Americans. In this global pandemic, he will hopefully play a lead role in overseeing the implementation of President Biden's national strategy for COVID-19 response, which is integral to defeating the virus that's plagued our country for far too long. His history-making nomination as the first Latino to manage this department comes in a time when this pandemic is affecting communities of color at much higher rates than Americans. And those of us who know him personally know the level of his concern and the strength of his dedication to protecting the health and safety of all hardworking Americans and their families. I deeply believe, and I've had the privilege of making this statement to another committee as well, that Javier Becerra is the right candidate to lead the Department of Health and Human Services at this time, and I would give him my strongest recommendation to this committee to approve his nomination. And Mr. Chairman, it's good to see you again after this morning's hearing, and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Senator Feinstein, and we're very pleased to, to have you here. And I would also like to note that California now has 100% of their United States senators here for the launch of the nomination of uh, the AG. And we welcome our new colleague, uh, Senator Padilla. So, uh, thank you, Chair Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, for inviting me to address this committee today to introduce my friend and California Attorney General Javier Becerra. As we uh, recognized in yesterday's HELP Committee hearing, our nation is going through one of the toughest times we have faced in recent memory. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken an incredible toll on our lives and on communities across the United States. COVID-19 deaths in the United States just surpassed 500,000, a grim milestone for our country. As has been referenced, the devastation has disproportionately impacted working class families and communities of color, very similar to the communities that both Attorney General Becerra and I grew up in. These communities are hurting and dying at alarming rates, and they desperately need someone who knows these communities at their core. The Los Angeles Times published an article this past Saturday documenting the disparity in vaccination rates across in this particular case, Los Angeles County, where wealthy neighborhoods like Beverly Hills are receiving vaccines at five times the rate of predominantly minority communities such as South Los Angeles. And that's why I'm honored to introduce Attorney General Becerra today as the nominee for Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. If confirmed, Attorney General Becerra will be the first Latino Secretary of Health and Human Services, an honor I know that he will not take lightly. Throughout his upbringing and time as a public servant, Javier has shown his passion for people and his commitment to improving the lives of those he represents. His parents immigrated from Mexico, just like my parents did, with the dream of building a better life for themselves and their family. Uh, as has been noted, Javier received his undergraduate and law degrees from Stanford University. And while at Stanford, he met his wife, Dr. Carolina Reyes, a widely respected obstetrician who helps care for women with high-risk pregnancies in underserved communities. Javier's first job out of law school was working with individuals with mental health disorders, a health issue that is too often overlooked, especially in communities of color. He was elected to Congress in 1992, where he quickly gained and maintained a reputation for being a strong supporter of reproductive health, protections for seniors, mental health parity, and the Children's Health Insurance Program, also known as CHIP. Javier was instrumental in both the drafting and the passing of the Affordable Care Act, which has helped provide access to quality health care for uh, millions of previously uninsured Americans. And his work did not stop there. 
as Attorney General of California, he's made it his mission to tackle structural inequalities within our healthcare system. He has been the leading force behind the lawsuit to protect the Affordable Care Act and to maintain the protections for people with pre-existing conditions and for those suffering from a mental illness. Over the past year, Attorney General Becerra fought to protect frontline health care workers from further exposure to COVID-19, and he stood up for homeowners struggling to meet their mortgage payments. <clears throat> now, while I understand the politics of the moment may compel some to try and paint a distorted picture of Attorney General Becerra, let me point out that many of you have worked with him for decades here in Congress. Republicans and Democrats know Javier Becerra to be a thoughtful, open-minded leader and always willing to listen to both sides. It appears to me, as it appears to many, that he's being held to a much different standard than some of the nominees that this Senate has supported and confirmed over the last four years. Let me say this. Both Attorney General Becerra and I, throughout our careers, have too often been the only Latino in the room. Sadly, Javier and I are not unfamiliar with being held to different standards. But members of the committee, Javier Becerra is a proven leader who is uniquely qualified to take on the challenges of this moment. And I urge the committee to support his nomination. Thank you. Senator, thank you very much. And we're very glad that you're here today. And I would say to you and Senator Feinstein, thank you both for your statements. We know you have very busy schedules and uh, feel free to, uh, to depart uh, uh, should you wish to. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, let me also, uh, one other item of business before we turn to the nominee for his opening statements. Um, we're gonna take a quick moment to enter a number of letters of support into the hearing record for Secretary-designate Becerra. As of this morning, the Finance Committee had received 73 letters of support for Mr. Becerra from a wide range of groups and stakeholders representing patients and nurses and doctors and public health advocates, civil rights groups, and many more. Without objection, I'd like to make those uh, materials part of today's hearing record. And with that, um, Attorney General Becerra, we welcome you. We look forward to your opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, and to Ranking Member Crapo and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, to my good friends, uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Padilla, I thank them as well for their gracious introduction. I want to thank my family, if I may begin by doing that, uh, Dr. Carolina Reyes, who has been my long-term partner. I call her my North Star. She is here with me. Uh, our three daughters, Natalia, Olivia, and Clarissa, and Clarissa's husband, Ivan. Uh, everything I do, including this, is a family affair. And I know I'm here because my parents, Manuel and Maria Teresa, who had only their health and their hope when they settled in Sacramento, California, taught me to earn the American dream. A construction worker with a sixth grade education and a clerical worker who arrived from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, they never saw the inside of a college classroom, but they sent all their kids to one or to the military. We lost my dad last year on New Year's Day, and when the end came, my dad knew we were there with him at his side in our home. Sadly, hundreds of thousands of Americans haven't had that closure this past year. That, Senators, is why I am here today. The COVID pandemic has killed more than 500,000 Americans, many of them alone without their families. Millions more have lost their jobs and their health care. That is not the America my parents would believe possible. To meet this moment, we need strong federal leadership. That's what President Biden is demonstrating, and if I'm fortunate to be confirmed, I look forward to joining the President in this critical mission. I understand the enormous challenges before us and our solemn responsibility to be faithful stewards of an agency that touches almost every aspect of our lives. I'm humbled by the task, and I'm ready for it. The mission of HHS 
to enhance the health and well-being of all Americans is core to who I am. When I was a child, my mom had a health scare. She was rushed to the hospital after hemorrhaging at home. The image is seared in my memory. We were lucky. My mom is now 87 years young. Better put, we were blessed. My dad, the laborer, he had insurance through his union, Labor's Local 185. We didn't have much, but we didn't have to face the threat of unpaid medical bills or even bankruptcy. Over two decades in Congress, I worked to ensure every family had the same assurance that my family had. I helped expand the Children's Health Insurance Program. I helped write and pass the Affordable Care Act. From the Ways and Means Committee, I fought to strengthen and modernize Medicare and how we finance it. As Attorney General, I created a Health Care Rights and Access task, task Force. We cracked down on Medicare and Medicaid fraud. I've worked to hold opioid manufacturers accountable for the addiction crisis. I've taken on hospitals and drug makers who unfairly jack up prices on patients. And I've protected patients' rights in privacy. If confirmed, I'll work with you to continue this type of work and to address HHS's biggest challenges. And that, of course, starts with COVID. The President has ambitious goals, 100 million vaccine shots in arms in his first 100 days, increasing access to testing, sequencing the virus so we're prepared for the variants, reopening schools and businesses. HHS has a central role in meeting these goals safely and equitably. As Attorney General, I saw the importance of this on the front lines. I work with colleagues in other states, both Republican and Democrats, to make COVID treatments more readily available. I am ready to work with you, with our state and local partners, our tribal partners, our territorial partners, and across government to get this right. Next, we must ensure people have access to the quality and affordable health care that they need. If confirmed, I will work with you to strengthen our Medicare and Medicaid lifelines, to reduce the cost of health care and prescription drugs, and ensure we are accountable, spending resources wisely and effectively. And I won't forget the other H in HHS, human services. I want to work with you supporting our vulnerable children, those in foster care, strengthening Head Start, and expanding access to child care. Finally, we must restore faith in our public health institutions. That starts with putting science and the facts first and showing respect for our career workforce. No one understands your state and your communities better than you. We may not always agree, but if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, I will always listen to you and keep an open mind. I will look for common cause, and I will work with you to improve the health and dignity of the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Crapo, and members for this opportunity to share my vision. Mr. Attorney General, thank you. And there's some obligatory questions that we ask nominees before we get into questions. First, is there anything you're aware of in your background that might present a conflict of interest with the duties of the office to which you've been nominated? No, Mr. Chairman. Second, do you know of any reason, personal or otherwise, that would in any way prevent you from fully and honorably discharging the responsibilities of the office to which you've been nominated? No, Mr. Chairman. Do you agree without reservation to respond to any reasonable summons to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the Congress if you're confirmed? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Finally, if, do you commit to provide a prompt response in writing to any questions addressed to you by any senator of this committee? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We will now begin, uh, Mr. Tur Attorney General, with five-minute rounds of, uh, of senators. I'll begin, and then uh, Senator Crapo. I think we all understand that the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded the country's longstanding health disparities. The fact is America really has two health care systems. In the suburbs, often affluent white families have all kinds of incredible health care. That's a stark difference to areas where many more black or Latino families live. They really face, in many instances, health care deserts. For those communities, long drives, long wait times, or a lack of health providers are enormous constraints. This is especially true when it comes to mental health, where the United States has the worst record among similar countries. Here's a statistic to remember. Women today are more likely to die in childbirth than their mothers. Women of color have borne the brunt of this tragedy. Black, American, Indian, Alaskan Native women are three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than their white 
counterparts. So our first question is, do you agree that extending Medicaid coverage from just 60 days to 12 months postpartum as the House COVID-19 relief bill provides is a necessary step to reverse this rising maternal mortality crisis? Mr. Chairman, absolutely. And if my wife were allowed to say a few words, she'd probably say, keep going, don't stop. Good. If you're confirmed, uh, Mr. Attorney General, what else would you do right out of the gate to address the significant racial, ethnic, and geographic disparities in maternal health? Mr. Chairman, I've worked on this for many years. Uh, we need better data. We have to be collecting information that lets us know where to go. If we collect bad data, we're going to have bad results. So one of the first things we have to do is make sure that we're collecting good data, and that's a responsibility that HHS has in many respects. We also have to reach out to the communities that know the people that we're missing. Go to the civic and religious leaders back home where we know we're missing families. They are respected. They are trusted. They can help us reach out to those folks. We have to train a better workforce, a bigger workforce, and we have to make sure they're competent in the cultural and linguistic differences that oftentimes we see. And of course, we have to tackle the social determinants of health that I think I'm proud to say now as I watch what Congress is doing, it's great to see how, how much it's a bipartisan effort now. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, let's return to the issue of mental health for a moment. And I think it would be fair to say from sea to shining sea, communities are reporting that mental health demands for services have just soared into the stratosphere. And it is for virtually every group, for seniors, even schools, you know, youngsters who have had challenges uh, learning are reporting uh, being in need of uh, mental health services. And I wanna say, I think this mental health challenge right now is the public health equivalent of a four alarm fire. It is just that serious with the situation of care being too expensive or unavailable. And it's something I take very personally because my brother was a schizophrenic. And for years, there were nights in our household where he would be out on the streets and we were convinced he was gonna hurt himself or someone else. So the question then is, what do we do about it? And one of the solutions comes from my home state. And it deals with some of the challenges that we're facing on the streets. I've talked to several of my colleagues here, and Senator Crapo and I have had discussions about it. On the streets, very often the question is, do you look to a mental health counselor or do you look to law enforcement to try to respond in the appropriate way? And we've come up with a program in my home state called CAHOOTS which is supported by both mental health counselors and law enforcement people. Senator Cortez Mastow is our lead sponsor. A number of other colleagues are for it as well. And our approach deploys Medicaid, which would be under your jurisdiction, to set up mobile crisis response teams that can be dispatched when a person is experiencing a mental health or substance use disorder that would be appropriately handled from the mental health side rather than the law enforcement side. So my question is, and, and time is short, and I apologize for that. If you're confirmed, would you be supportive of efforts like the CAHOOTS program so we can expand it in my home state of Oregon, but also implement it across the land? Senator, count me in. I know law enforcement back home would say the same thing. It's, a, it's not a good use of our resources as we watch uh, as a 911 call comes in and we're now seeing a person who's in, me in distress, usually mental distress, on the streets. It's our officers who are asked to respond as they will tell you. They're not trained professionals on mental health care, social services. They're trained to do uh, public safety protection. And they would love to have people working with them so we can make sure the right professional is the first responder to these cases. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Senator Wyden. Uh, Attorney General Becerra, as, as we discussed, uh, you know I strongly support private insurance to allow consumers to choose the health care coverage that best meets their needs. Uh, but your longstanding support for single-payer, government-run health care seems hostile to our current system from my perspective. Uh, 
What assurances can you give to Americans who currently have private insurance, including through Medicare Advantage, and are satisfied with their insurance provider that they will not lose their coverage in the future to some sort of Medicare for all approach or other uh, federal takeover of insurance, I mean, excuse me, of health care. Senator Craper, first, thank you for uh, the chance to respond to the question and also the time you gave me to sit and chat. I will tell you that we will both agree that the most important thing is to give everyone in this country coverage, good coverage, and what I will tell you is I'm here at the pleasure of the President of the United States. He's made it very clear where he is. He wants to build on the Affordable Care Act. That will be my mission to uh, achieve the goals that President Biden put forward to build on the Affordable Care Act. So, well, I appreciate hearing that. And, and uh, could you just go a little bit further? I'd like to know what your feelings are about the Medicare Advantage program. That's, one of the, I think, one of the most uh, successful parts of our Medicare system and one in which uh, the people who choose it, who are increasing dramatically around the country, are showing by their votes in support of it that they think it's a program that is meeting their needs and helping them significantly. But what is your uh, perspective of the Medicare Advantage program? Senator, millions of Americans depend on Medicare Advantage uh, of our seniors. Uh, we, we see that Medicare Advantage gives us an easier chance to do what are called wraparound programs, uh, to reach out to more people with more services. And I think we have to take every approach we can because at the end of the day, as I said at the beginning, it's about getting more health care to people at an affordable price and with good quality. And so whether it's in rural America or urban America, what we have to do is see how we can make Medicare for our seniors work better. Thank you. And I want to move to the HI Trust Fund. Uh, I know that you're aware that the trust fund is in dire status. The most recent Medicare trustees report projected that the HI Trust Fund would be officially bankrupt in 2026, at which time it would no longer be able to pay full benefits for our nation's seniors and the disabled. That report failed to include any analysis showing the fiscal impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the trust fund. Earlier this month, the Congressional Budget Office released its updated winter baseline, and the new baseline takes into account the increased tax revenue due to stronger economic forecasts. But while CBO now also predicts that the HI Trust Fund will be insolvent in 2026, there is substantial uncertainty behind their projections. Given the recent Medicare spending trends, it seems unlikely that the Trust Fund could remain solvent through 2025. Will you commit to me today that if you're confirmed that you'll immediately direct the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the chief actuary, to provide an update to me in writing that shows the current status of the Medicare HI insolvency date, taking into account the fiscal impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator, I, I can commit to you that. We will absolutely look forward to working with you to give this committee, you and this committee, the information we need to make the right decisions when it comes to Medicare moving forward. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, Congress has historically looked to reform and adjust Medicare payments to providers in order to extend the life of the HI Trust Fund. Uh, however, the last time Congress enacted significant Medicare savings, the money was used to finance further spending. Uh, can you tell me, you know, we're now here a decade later, and those savings are no longer available to protect Medicare. What policies do you now think Congress should consider to extend the life of the HI Trust Fund? And, Senator, I, we, I remember well our experiences on the Bull Simpson Commission, which I thought was a tremendous experience because it really brought some thoughtful minds together. Um, here's what I think we, I can tell you right off the bat. Uh, I believe you and I, in fact, everyone here can agree that our seniors who paid into Medicare should not be harmed by our need to come up with policy recommendations and, and solutions. And so, first and foremost, our beneficiaries must come first in any discussion about this. Uh, secondly, as you know, and as we worked on Bull Simpson, and you, I know you've done since, uh, there are short-term solutions, and then there are the longer-term solutions. And none are, are easy, otherwise we would have done them already. But here's what I would suggest to you. President Biden is prepared to tackle this because our seniors depend on it. And we, we've seen what Medicare has done in pulling so many seniors out of poverty from the 1960s before it was enacted to today. And so what I will tell you is the team at HHS, should I be fortunate to be confirmed, will be ready to sit down with you to dis discuss this and more on Medicare's future. 
All right, thank you very much. I'm out of time. I, I would have asked you, and I'll probably ask you to just respond to this in uh, writing afterward, but I'd like to know how soon we can expect that opportunity to develop a comprehensive legislative proposal from HHX that will extend the life of the trust fund. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Senator Crapo. Senator Stamina. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. It's wonderful uh, to have you in front of us, uh, Attorney General Becerra, and it was wonderful to serve with you in the House of Representatives and work on so many issues that related to health care and behavioral health. And as I told you, I think when I called right after you were nominated, uh, I was very excited to see that someone of your values and experience and competency would be nominated by President Biden to lead this incredibly important agency. And, and I do say I don't, uh, I know some have said that uh, they're concerned that uh, you're not a doctor. Well, I'm, uh, our former HHS secretary was a drug company executive, a CEO, and you've been on the other side as an attorney general and congressman fighting uh, high drug prices. So that's the side I, I'm glad to have a HHS secretary on. So um, it's wonderful to have you here. And I have to say, I am so pleased this morning that there's been so much focus on mental health and want to ask uh, and, and thank uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman uh, uh, about uh, all of these uh, issues because I know you as well have experienced in behavioral health and has, has been stated your career started as a legal aid attorney supporting clients with mental health issues, um, among others, and that you've worked to enforce the Mental Health Parity Act in California, made reforms to decriminalize mental illness and more. So I want to just add my voice today, as you and I have talked about privately, because more than half of the adults in the U.S. right now report mental health as being negatively impacted for them due to stress over the coronavirus, which certainly is not a surprise given what's happened to people. As of August 2020, one in four young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 say they've considered suicide in the past month because of the pandemic, which um, is incredibly concerning. Drug overdoses accelerating, CDC reporting the most overdose deaths ever, ever over the last 12 month period. So we want to make sure, uh, and I, you're hearing it today, that people with mental illness or substance abuse disorders are not left behind in what is happening. And the good news is, is that uh, we're seeing some great progress because through the creation and expansion of new certified community behavioral health centers, um, and I know Oregon's been benefiting from this, which has allowed funding to be able to do some creative things. Um, uh, we're seeing a difference. In fact, the, the most recent HHS budget found that these services led to a 63% decrease in emergency room visits for behavioral health and a 60% decrease in time spent in jails, which is why uh, these comprehensive community services are so widely supported by law enforcement, and a 41% decrease in homelessness. And so uh, let me just ask, we, we have now uh, com comprehensive community centers, actually 340 of them across 41 states, but communities across the country, every state wants to be able to do this, like we have federally qualified health centers with comprehensive funding. We now have this model for behavioral health, and it really needs to be permanent and comprehensive. So I wondered if you would talk about some of your goals, uh, again, about um, ensuring coverage, paying for behavioral health, and can I count on you to work with us to uh, move forward to make this a very effective proven program now permanent as a nationwide expansion of the Certified Community Behavioral Health Center program. Senator, uh, thank you for the question. And I, I have to first say thank you for the work that you've done. If there is someone who has been the uh, patron saint for this issue, I think you are, you, you, you get to qualify for that title because it's so important. Many of these folks, as you know, feel like no one really cares. And the, their esteem goes up when someone talks about their issues, uh, their, the respect that they deserve increases. And so I will say this, uh, the money that you all made available uh, to help us expand some of these centers, more, most of it, I, I think 500 of the 600 million is already on the streets, on the ground, trying to help. Uh, the more we coordinate, uh, 
directly with our local partners will be more effective. We have to also reach out more effectively with our Indian Health Services uh, uh, folks. And uh, I think what we can do is elevate this issue because the laws are, as, as the chairman said, the law is already there. We're supposed to treat mental health services with parity. We're supposed to provide that behavioral health service. What we're learning is that these centers, that coordinated approach really helps us do it better. Well, thank you so much. I know my time is up, Mr. Chairman, and so I will just ask uh, for the record uh, questions related to expanding access to home health services and Alzheimer's, maternal infant health, cost of prescription drugs. There's a lot that we need to do together that will make a real difference in the lives of Americans across the country. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Stabenow. Senator Grafley. I'll bet you're just waiting to talk about abortion. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to start with something that's a fact. Uh, during the second trimester of fetal surgery, fetal surgery, doctors may administer anesthesia to reduce pain experienced by the unborn. So, question: Do you believe it should be routine to also give anesthesia to unborn children during late-term abortion to minimize the pain that they're capable of experiencing? Senator, you're asking, a, I know, an important question, but a very technical question. And, and you're, you're moving into an area which I know carries with it very deeply held beliefs, uh, where folks sometimes have differences. And I respect that. I also want to make it clear that I respect the law and the science. And what I can tell you is that in my career of having worked to protect the health of all Americans, men, women, young, old, uh, what I would do as secretary is what I've done as the attorney general of our state, and that is I would follow the law and expect others to follow the law. Yeah. And while we may not always see it the same way in terms of how we get there on a particular issue, I will tell you that uh, on health care, these challenges we have to confront for the American people. So I, I would look forward to trying to reach that common ground with you and others. Well, I appreciate that. And I think you made my question more complicated than I meant it to be. I wasn't asking you, were you for late-term abortions or not? I was asking about during that process whether or not you thought that uh, the, the baby ought to have pain uh, in the process of that, a painkiller in the process of that abortion like we have a requirement for fetal surgery. So maybe you can't answer that question, but I didn't mean to get into whether or not you support late-term abortions or not. And, and Senator, let me, let me try to uh, address that if I can more directly. It still might not be enough for you, but I, I, I tried to make clear that I would rely on the science and the experts uh, as okay. the secretary of HHS to help us make decisions to the degree that the agency has any role in making some decisions related to that. I would rely on the science and the experts. Okay, thank you. Now I want to go to something that the chairman, Senator Wyden, and I worked together on and worked in good faith and arrived at quite a compromise, and it deals with the subject of prescription drugs. Uh, I believe Congress must pass something like what he and I worked out last year in a bipartisan way because we have this 60-volt requirement, and I think it might be very difficult to get something through that would take 60 votes that some people in your political party are thinking about doing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and most of that deals with whether or not we're just going to put a cap on increase in drug prices as the best way to uh, get to solving the uh, high cost of prescription drugs or whether we're going to have the government negotiate prices, which basically the government uh, dictates prices. And also we have some uh, letters from CBO over a long period of time that says that it really doesn't save money, where the Wyden-Grassley bill saves about $95 billion. So this is my question. Do you know if the Biden administration would be interested in enacting a bipartisan prescription drug pricing reform bill, uh, like, for instance, what along the lines of what Wyden and I worked out, 
that actually saves the taxpayers dollars and get, can get 60 votes in the United States Senate. And it'll be a lot easier to get up under a Schumer majority leader position than it was under a McConnell leadership position. Or do you think they want the alternative of trying to get something a lot uh, st stronger from the Democrat point of view along the lines of what I suggested? Senator, you've asked a great question, which probably would be easier for me to answer if I were still a House member or a Senate <laughs> member, uh, because those negotiations really are up to you all. But I will tell you this, I, there's no doubt that President Biden wants to see us lower the price of prescription medicine. And he and his team, and if I'm fortunate to be part of that team, will be working with you on a bipartisan fashion to reach a solution. And I want to congratulate you and uh, Chairman Wyden for the work that you've done in the past to try to bring members together. Got one second left. Uh, we passed a bill that I've been working on for six years, and you will be in a position to get the regulations and get it underway. It sets up an alternative program for uh, uh, rural hospitals, um, uh, and it's called the Rural Emergency Hospital Program. And what would it would work this way? Uh, a critical access hospital would have the alternative. They wouldn't be forced to do this. This would be an alternative that if they want to give up their residential beds and preserve the other things that hospitals would do, then they could do that. And, and it's my way of keeping when there's only 4% occupancy in most of these critical access hospitals, uh, uh, and it's a very expensive thing for them to operate, will maintain rural health services short of uh, pay, uh, residence beds. So I, I don't know that you know enough about the bill that we passed, but I think it's very critical. The American Hospital Association worked with us, the Iowa Hospital Association, and I'd like to get that thing up and running as fast as we could. Senator, I, I know the time has expired, but let me just say, and we can follow up with this uh, question, uh, that I am absolutely looking forward to working with you on this. People often forget California, as big as it is, has some very large rural areas. And I was approached by many of our state legislators when I was trying to tackle the whole issue of hospital over-consolidation, you know, hospitals gobbling each, each other up, and they said, you got to make sure you're very careful because in some of our rural communities, there may be only one facility, and they may not have any choice if they're going to survive, but to have a major player come in and take them over. And so please make sure that you don't think that a rural facility, which is a standing out there by itself, is just like all these other places in urban America. And so... Co colleagues, we're just going to have to move, move, move on, and I... I, uh, I will follow up, but, Senator, I look forward to working with you. I thank, thank you. I thank the Senator from Iowa. Senator Cantwell, and then Senator Sin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General Becerra, I'm so excited and proud of your uh, nomination because of the diversity and breadth of experience and uh, basically just following many of the decisions you've made over your career. So very much appreciate seeing you here today as, as President Biden's nominee. Uh, following up on Senator Grassley's drug questions, because it's topical of the moment, um, we had a chance to discuss drug shortage issues, the fact that uh, the price of insulin is just too darn high and that uh, shortages and issues. Do you think there's more that the FDA and the FTC should do in this area? Absolutely. We cannot afford to see drug shortages continue. We have to plan ahead. We have to work on the supply chain. We have to make sure that we don't encounter a situation where Americans in one, one part of the country have the medication they need, but in other parts they don't. Well, there's no reason to see the spikes that we've seen in insulin. Is that correct? That we that there are policies that we could be putting in place. Well, and, and in some cases, what we're finding is, is that these are artificially created. Yes. Thank you for saying that. I hope Senator Grassley just left the room. But I hope <laughs> he and I have done some work on this. But I hope that uh, because in his role in judiciary, but I plan to do uh, a lot on this issue as it relates to the Federal Trade Commission and uh, its oversight. Turning to the broader issues of affordability of health care. Uh, we also had a chance to talk about uh, the basic health plan, something that was part of the Affordable Care Act to take care of people above the Medicaid rate, but at a very cost-effective way to bundle uh, people who don't have access to insurance and make it a more interesting market, but still leave states in control of uh, helping to negotiate on those programs. So 
the end result of that has been 800,000 people in the state of New York uh, buying insurance at basically $500 an annual premium and saving more than $1,000 for what we would save for those individuals on the silver plan. So is this something, this concept, uh, something that we should continue to look at as a way to both leverage and bundle up people who aren't quite uh, as interesting to the market right above that Medicaid rate? Certainly, Senator. I think uh, Minnesota as well has also done this, and it's another innovation. It's another way, especially for uh, states that are willing to put skin in the game to make this happen, to try to get to the point where we're providing more coverage, better coverage, lower, lower cost. Well, I think, you know, my colleagues who, you know, talking about already who said, well, we don't, we, want to, we don't want this, we don't want that, we've combined the best. I mean, in the concept of allowing a state to uh, still be in charge of that end product, but to uh, allow people to propose from the private uh, provider some sort of discounted rate, which uh, I definitely think that we need to be getting more out of the providers on, on discount. Not to say that you can't have other public options, I just think this one has been working and, and successful on, on that front. Um, also, the issue of N95 masks and frauds uh, have come up in the state of Washington. I want to know that you'll do everything you can. I personally believe that we need a task force at this point in time between the FDA and Border and Customs and DOJ and others to uh, look at this issue. Again, the FTC, we've given the FTC broad authority now to fine immediately on uh, uh, anybody who takes advantage of the COVID pandemic to manipulate or to uh, uh, overcharge. And I, I, you know, we have healthcare workers and we're asking them to go into these situations and then they're finding out big vast amounts of supply of these masks don't meet the standards. So we need to be aggressive here with the FDA on a task force to make sure that we are looking at this. Yeah, I can't, couldn't agree more, Senator. I think the HHS would be more than willing to work. As you know, our jurisdiction comes more in the, on the side of certifying what it takes to have a mask that works. Uh, we will work with our partners. And by the way, state and local and tribal and territorial partners are important too because they're the ones that are on the ground. I've had to, as the AG in California, work to go after some of the fraud, the uh, gouging that's gone on with some of these products during pandemics and, and disasters. And so we're willing to work with you. I've had that experience as a prosecutor doing this. And now, if I'm fortunate to be confirmed as Secretary of HHS, we will partner with all those different agencies that you've mentioned to try to get to this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I thank my colleague. And just very quickly before we go to Senator Thune, we have a bipartisan effort on insulin prices out of this committee, a report that we did. Prices have gone up 12-fold in recent years, and the drug is not 12 times better. It's essentially a product of price gouging. And Senator Grassley and I put together this report. We're going to put it in to the record without out objection after Senator Cantwell's um, good statement. Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Becerra, welcome to the committee. Um, you've heard a number of my colleagues, starting with the chairman, talk about a long, big range of public health issues that we have to deal with, starting with the pandemic. And Senator Crapel talked about Medicare and Medicaid, and Senator Grassley talked about rural health. I'd like to come up to, with IHS here in just a minute. But in examining your record, I want to come back to this for just a minute, because it does seem like, as Attorney General, you spend an inordinate amount of time and effort um, suing pro-life organizations, like Little Sisters of the Poor, or um, trying to ease uh, restrictions or expand abortion. And you're going to have a big job as Secretary of Health and Human Services if confirmed. So how do you assure us that, because I think mo the majority of American people would not want their Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, focused or fixated on expanding abortion when we've got all these public health issues to deal with. So how do you, how do you uh, assure us that that's not going to be something that continues over from your time as Attorney General? Senator, uh, thank you very much for giving me a chance to, to answer the question. And, and here, I, I, I think I try to say to Senator Grassley, I, I understand that uh, Americans have different, deeply held beliefs on, on this particular issue, and, and I absolutely respect that. By the way, I, I have never sued the nuns, any nuns. I have taken on the federal government, uh, but I've never sued any uh, affiliation of, of nuns. 
And my actions have always been directed at the uh, federal agencies because they have been trying to do things that are contrary to the law in California. We have a, we have, uh, I, my, it's my job to defend the rights of my state and uphold the law. But what I will say to you is this, um, as I try to uphold the law, I recognize that people will look at these things a little bit differently. And here's where I think there's an opportunity, and now as Secretary of HHS, if I'm fortunate to be confirmed, working with all of you to try to see if we can find that common cause on how we move forward on this very, very difficult issue, but very important for so many Americans. Let me um, shift to, uh, I mentioned Indian Health Service. I know there's a significant uh, tribal population in California. I want to draw your attention to specific issues that we faced with uh, Indian Health Service in the Great Plains region. IHS-run facilities in South Dakota have lost accreditation on more than one occasion for failure to comply with safety and quality measures, and multiple health care providers have been exposed for abusing patients. We have to talk about the leadership and management failures that have led to this situation. It can't be blamed all on funding. HHS has got to be involved in active and driving improvements at IHS and demanding excellence from its leadership. If confirmed, what specific uh, actions would you take to hold IHS accountable to the patients it serves as well as to the Congress who often faces obstacles in getting answers to important oversight questions? I know this one's important to you, Senator, and, and so many who have uh, a number of our tribal communities in their state. Uh, transparency. Uh, we must work much better at providing you and others uh, and those in these tribal communities with the information they need, uh, better data, uh, but mostly it's accountability. Uh, and that I commit to you. Uh, and I'd say that as someone who has represented more than 100 tribes in the state of California for, for many, many years, that we owe it to our, our tribal governments, uh, our native uh, communities to be there. We owe it to them because they have sovereign rights. We have a trust responsibility. And so what I can tell you is uh, we will work with you. I will say one thing. IHS has done something right working with uh, tribal communities because they've had more success than many states in actually putting vaccines in arms recently, and uh, we, we do need to applaud them when they've done something well. I've got a bill with Senator Barrasso um, that uh, would improve management hiring practices at IHS, and I would like, uh, if you end up getting confirmed, to, to work Look with you on that. Look forward to working with you. Um, I know you heard about 340B a few times yesterday, so I'll try to keep this quick, but to me, the key to 340B is that it enables hospitals and covered entities to provide community benefits that otherwise may not be available. If confirmed, will you commit to ensuring the strength of the 340B program and the community that it supports? Absolutely. Not just in your rural communities, but I've got inner city communities that I've had to represent who depend on 340B. Good. All right. One last quick question, and I would say that this is probably the one bright spot of the pandemic has been telehealth. That's something that I've been working with uh, this committee on for a long time. As we continue to look at options for expanding telehealth, what will your approach be to taking administrative action at HHS and CMS, and what legislative approaches from the Congress would you support? Well, we've learned a lot, Senator, from COVID, uh, and we've seen how important it is to have broadband reach all our communities. We've seen how we have to have some flexibility, but mostly what we can do is talk to the communities that are actually now benefiting from it in our rural uh, parts of America, in other parts that didn't have the broadband before to find out what it is that we can do to do it better. But I don't think we're going back to the old days when it comes to telehealth. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, if, I wish they could take their conversations. Could, off of the... could, could you all uh, take Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a little hearing issue. Mr. Becerra, welcome. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, uh, a few quick questions that hopefully you can help glide through with me so that I can get to some other things. Uh, you were a member of the Ways and Means Committee, which is almost the equivalent of the Finance Committee. I say almost because we have pride here in the Finance <laughs> Committee uh, uh, of the House of Representatives. Is that, is that, not, is that not correct? That's correct. And as such, were you there during the period of time in which the Affordable Care Act was being uh, legislated? That's correct. Were you instrumental in various parts of the Affordable Care Act? I was in those rooms. And uh, as part of that, uh, you became familiar that the Affordable Care Act created the opportunity for millions to get health care coverage who did not have it before, correct? I was very active on those provisions. And to create affordability for millions who uh, found it less affordable, who created Medicaid expansion. Is that fair to say? 
That's, that's correct. And, and who also closed the donut hole for prescription drugs for seniors. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. So you had all of the experience during that whole period of time. It also created a special provisions for women's health. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. Now, as Attorney General of California, California has the fifth largest economy in the world, is it not, if it were an independent country? That is correct. As Attorney General, what was the size of the office of the Attorney General? We were several thousand, uh, over a billion dollar budget. So several thousand over a billion dollar budget. Now let me ask you this, when you took an oath uh, as when you were uh, chosen to be the Attorney General of the State of uh, California, you took an oath, did you not? I did. And in that oath, uh, I believe that part of that oath was to preserve, protect, and defend not only the Constitution of the United States, but the Constitution of the State of California and the laws of California. That's correct. You don't pass the laws, you defend them. That's correct. Now, let me ask you this. Um, if you took, uh, if you're succe successful, and I believe you will be, at uh, being confirmed uh, by the Senate, and you take that off, then you're going to defend the laws of the United States as they exist at the time. That's correct. Uh, uh, I find it interesting that many of my colleagues have raised issues about you being a lawyer and without sufficient experience. The reality is, is that thousands of employees under your direction experienced firsthand in creating the most significant landmark legislation on health care and dealing with issues of Medicare and Medicaid within the Committee of Ways and Means jurisdiction. That, that seems to be a problem, but the previous secretary of HHS was also a lawyer. The only thing is that he was a lawyer at a drug company that ultimately uh, did a pretty good job in fleecing insulin patients. Uh, so I, I hope, uh, I don't think that we'd see that from you. Let me ask you a few specific policy questions. Um, you and I had an opportunity to talk. Uh, will you work with us uh, on improving diversity in clinical trials? Uh, because this is an area that we think lacks, and I've written to all of the companies that are engaged in clinical trials. Uh, most of them have been pretty responsive but is something I think we need to do in order to make sure that all of America is represented in these trials. Senator, absolutely. As I always say, if you have bad inputs going in, you're going to produce bad outputs, and if we're going to start having studies reflect the American people, we have to have good inputs. Would you work with me and others to improve diagnoses of black and Latino dementia patients as we begin to address Alzheimer disparities in communities of color? Absolutely. Uh, well, one of the things of the pandemic is that it has magnified the incredible disparities that exist in our society, particularly in terms of the health care of minority communities. Um, will you commit to working with me on ways to reduce the disparity for communities of color in the delivery of our health care system? Yes, sir. Um, let me ask you uh, a question. Uh, we've had a bipartisan support here for a program called McVeigh Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. Uh, I used to work with Senator Enzi when he was uh, on the committee on it, and I look forward to working with others. Uh, do you support an expansion of this valuable program? Senator, as you know, my wife is a maternal fetal medicine specialist, and uh, so I have an in-house lobbyist. You've got me squeezed me. between you and her, and uh, the, the response is absolutely looking forward to working with you. And then uh, finally, uh, we uh, were able, uh, part of my work here was to ensure that we could uh, include a thousand new GME slots that Congress provided. Uh, I, I, I would like to get you to work with us to ensure that we quickly and efficiently implement uh, that provision of the law. Done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague. We're just going to. Um, move through this list of members. I think next is Senator Carper, who's available on the web. Is that actually correct? <laughs> Senator Carper. I've been asked by one of my colleagues. There you are. I just think that was... Senator Carp Carper, are you there? Hello, Ron? Yes. Ron? Hey, we're, Ron. Wa we're waiting for you, Senator Carper. Oh, good, 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 good. First of all, uh, General, how are you yes, today? Senator, I am well. The, uh, have, have, have any of our Republican friends questioned whether or not you have the, the ability or the, the, uh, to the, I would say, the experience in leading a large uh, organization? 
We, we've had some good discussions. No, are you asking us to be speaking? No, I'm, um, no, what I'm asking is, has anybody raised the question like, how could you lead an organization as big as HHS? What have you ever done that would suggest that you could do that? How would you respond to that? How I would respond, I'm sorry, say that the question again, how I would respond to? Yeah, like, like someone raised a question of, about your ability to lead an, organ, lead an organization as big as HHS. It's huge, as you know. Well, I, and what have you done in your life that would suggest, well, may, maybe I am up to that task? Yeah. Senator, for, for 30 years, I've been working on health care. Uh, my first job uh, out of- yeah, I'm thinking Boston. more of the administrative side. I'm uh, running a huge organization. I, my recoll recollection is talking to Kamala Harris is that the, the, the job that you have right now is, is not a small job. Yeah. Second largest Department of Justice in the land, uh, and I'd say over the four years that I was there, we outdid the largest Department of Justice in the land every time we were in court. Uh, we have continued to protect the largest state in the nation, and uh, we are an operation uh, that I think most people uh, would love to see the size in their operation. We're over a billion dollars and several thousand personnel, and uh, we do a really good job of protecting the rights and opportunities for Californians. That's, that's a pretty good answer. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, the role of uh, federally qualified community health centers and vaccination uh, effort that's going on? Can you talk to us about why that's important, particularly why that's important with, with uh, people of color? Senator, you, as you know, too many people are missed. Uh, they, are, they fall through the cracks. And community health clinics have been a, a godsend for many of these communities because oftentimes they're the only facility, the only uh, available source for good health care and with community clinics able to help provide the vaccine vaccines it makes it more possible for many of our families who've often been left behind to actually get the care and the protection that they need and so they've been indispensable thank you for the work that you and others have done to recognize how important they are and especially now during COVID um, I understand there was a hearing I think it was yesterday in the house yeah. that focused on a development of uh, additional uh, vaccines uh, beyond uh, Pfizer, beyond Moderna. And they included, uh, I think there was some discussion at the hearing on uh, with respect to AstraZeneca and with respect to Johnson & Johnson. Uh, have you had a chance to, to come up to speed on what was, what was uh, covered at that hearing? I, I haven't heard so much about what happened in that hearing. I was in my hearing uh, as well in the HELP Committee. But I do know something about that which is going on. It's been brought to my attention. Uh, certainly, HHS will be uh, on top of whatever happens with any future vaccines because it has to run. Those vaccines and those trials would run through our different agencies. Uh, would you just take a minute and just kind of describe this very briefly at a 30,000 feet foot level? The, uh, the, the, the process of this, the next steps in, the, uh, in approving getting go to getting emergency approval for uh, both uh, uh, AstraZeneca and the uh, Johnson Johnson oh, okay. vaccine. No, Cardin, so the FDA plays a very crucial role and along with CDC and uh, there are several other uh, sub agencies within HHS will have roles that are critical as we try to continue to uh, deal with the pandemic and uh, HHS I can guarantee you if I'm fortunate to be confirmed will make sure it is working at with due speed to make sure that whatever's within our bailiwick to handle, we do it quickly because we know how important it will be that Americans have a vaccine available. And while we've seen success, especially under President Biden's uh, tenure in reaching more and more Americans, and President Biden has announced that we have secured up to 600 million shots uh, of the vaccine for Americans, that we will continue to work to make sure that we are on top of it and ahead of the game when it comes to making sure we're protecting all Americans. Yeah. Uh, how long did you serve in the House? I was there for 24 years, sir. Did you ever meet a guy named John Carney? Of course. Uh, dear colleague, and now your governor. Yeah. He used to be a member of my cabinet, and I'm enormously proud of, of him. When uh, our, uh, we, usually our congressional delegation normally has a chance to catch up with him every couple of weeks. And the, uh, one of the comments we uh, continue to hear is uh, adequate uh, supply of vaccine uh, delivered uh, in a timely way and uh, in, in accordance with expectation, consistent with expectations. Yeah. Do, you, uh, do you have any, any thoughts on, on that uh, for us? 
and and I would my response is going to be based as a, a leader in my state and absolutely our states our local partners our tribal communities our territories they all want to know the same thing that we're going to we're going to be working in partnership with them that we will coordinate with them that we're not going to blindside them because they have to prepare they're the ones that are doing most of this on the ground they want to know that there's a real partnership so that we're not doing this as if we're the federal government and we know everything and so i i would expect that governor carney who is a is a champion for the people in the state uh, and is a, is a real fighter would make sure that he's he's on top of it because he's working closely with the federal government and I would look forward if I'm fortunate to be confirmed to get to work Clayback. with a, a former colleague I uh, uh, I understand in the hearing that yesterday uh, Johnson Johnson uh, reported that they were close to uh, being getting uh, getting the emergency uh, approval if you will from uh, uh, or emergency distribution approval from uh, the FDA. And I understand that uh, there was also, I believe, testimony that suggested that AstraZeneca could be uh, receive the uh, emergency approval uh, about a month later, I believe the beginning of, of April. The uh, folks at uh, AstraZeneca have the ability to produce a lot of, uh, produce a lot of their, their vaccine, uh, I'm told. And uh, I hope the same is true of uh, of uh, Johnson & Johnson, but we've been uh, really starved for vaccine for much the last several months. And I think we, but we could be in a position uh, all of a sudden to get uh, uh, actually more va vaccine than what we know what to do with. And I, that, was, that would be a good problem. But I would just ask that you be thinking about that because it's possible that we could just be flooded with this stuff in about a month and uh, make sure that when it comes and flows in uh, great quantities that we're ready to do something with it. And Se Senator Carper is asking about an especially important issue. Um, Mr. Attorney General, would you like to give a brief answer? Because we've got a lot of members waiting, but it's such an important question. Would you like to give a brief answer or we can move on? Senator, I'll just say to Senator Carper, look forward to working with him. We want to be prepared. We'd rather have more than less uh, to make sure we're saving lives. Very, very good. It's, Thank it's, you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. It's a very, very important area. Senator Car Cardin and Senator Langford are next. And colleagues, it is our intention, after consultation with the minority and with Senator Crapo, we will see if we can complete um, the business of the hearing by uh, 4 o'clock when we have the vote. My sense is we can't, and it would then be our intention to recess briefly between 4 and 4.15. And that is what we have oh, talked yes. about with um, Senator Crapo. So now we are at Senator Cardin and then Senator Langford. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and to my good friend Javier Becerra, uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about your career. I enjoyed our service together on the Ways and Means Committee, and I very much uh, remember the days of the Affordable Care Act and the work that you did on that. So it, uh, thank you for your willingness to continue to serve thank our you. country. Thank I want to talk about the provision, one of the provisions that was included in the Affordable Care Act which set up the offices for minority health throughout HHS and also established the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. The, the Chairman Wyden talked about uh, meeting the needs of the underserved communities. You've talked about it. I have no question about your commitment to provide services uh, to those who have been left behind uh, in healthcare in America. But my question to you is what strategy do you have to reinforce these offices that currently exist so the legacy of dealing with health disparities will be institutionalized within the Department of Health and the National Institutes of Health so that we will have a ongoing commitment to deal with the disparities in this country. Senator, thank you for the question and, and it is great to see you again and it brings back great memories of our work together. Um, the Office of Minority Health is a critical operation within HHS. I intend to make it an even more important office than perhaps its, uh, its stature has had in the past, simply because COVID has exposed what many of us already knew, and that is that we have failings when it comes to approaching all of our communities in, in America and giving them the same access. And so the Office of Minority Health will prove indispensable if we want to really tackle this beyond COVID. Uh, and so I look forward to working with you and others who are interested in this because there are several 
offices within HHS that deal with minority health, and certainly the principal office, uh, I will want to make sure I empower them. So I look forward to working with you. I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. If I'm fortunate to be confirmed, I think everyone in HHS has just heard this, that a, uh, the Office of Minority Health will have real prominence under my tenure if I'm fortunate to be confirmed. Thank you very much. You know, one of the uh, impacts of COVID-19 that's been a positive impact is that we've recognized the importance of telehealth and we've made it easier for providers to provide telehealth services. S some of these changes are not permanent in nature. Ha what is your strategy to try to expand the access to healthcare through telehealth, uh, which can easily uh, uh, make health more accessible to communities today that are challenged with accessibility? Senator, as, as I mentioned previously in, in response to some other questions, uh, we, we can't go back to the old days. Uh, tell, we've learned so much from COVID and how indispensable telehealth has been, especially to our rural communities, but also to some of our inner city communities. And here it's become very obvious. You don't have broadband accessibility. You're in real trouble. And so we have to do a much better job. We're now into the year 2021, and there are still parts of America that don't have good access to broadband. And now COVID has explained why it was so essential that we have worked harder in the past. So broadband access, critical. Uh, the, the flexibility that has been necessary uh, to make telehealth work for everyone. Now, we're, we're not going to go back to the old way of doing business. And so there are things that we're going to learn that help us. I look forward to working with you and members on this committee and beyond to try to see how we can make telehealth accessible to everyone. Thank you. On oral health, we, we've made progress with pediatric dental care, which is included under the Affordable Care Act as, as an essential service, but still our seniors lack uh, access to uh, certain dental care. Uh, pr uh, private insurance does not necessarily provide uh, dental care for routine dental work. Uh, so we still have a gap. Uh, do you have a, a strategy to try to expand access to dental care? As you know, good oral health care is essential to good general health. Uh, Senator, who can forget Diamante Driver, who Thank was you. a yeah. young resident in your state, who died uh, because his parents didn't really have the kind of access to uh, health care, in this case dental care, that they needed, and what was an infection turned into an abscess and turned into a lost life. And I will tell you that uh, dental health can be critical. Uh, you and I know this, and so I, I would look forward to working with you to try to see that us expand access to dental health, vision care, the types of things that sometimes we take for granted until we're in our later stages of life, but it's so critical, and the family of Diamante Driver can tell you that. And I would ask that you consider appointing the chief dental officer, which has been vacant by the previous administration. Last point I just want to raise, you've been talking about prescription drug costs, and that's certainly an issue you got to deal with, but in America, we have drug shortages of drugs that are relatively inexpensive but are not being manufactured by drug manufacturers because they're not making enough money on them, which is really causing uh, a health care issue. I would just urge you to make it a priority issue that there should not be a shortage of drugs in America that are necessary for health care because the, the private pharmaceutical network doesn't feel it's profitable enough to make those drugs. As Senator, I agree completely. Profit should be the reason that we're trying to come up with life-saving medication. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank my colleague, Senator Langford. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Sarris, good to see you. I know it's a, a tough process to go through. You've walked through this. You've been on the other side of this uh, in the House of Representatives to walk through a lot of these issues. I, I do need to get some clarity on a couple of things that I have, we've not talked about so far. Uh, as California Attorney General, you sued the federal government over 100 times including multiple times dealing with issues about conscience protection that you would specifically have to now enforce on the other side of it. And so I'm trying to get some clarity on this. There's a conscience, uh, conscience and religious freedom division at HHS. They have compiled the 25 different conscience laws that already exist in statute that are law. And to say that HHS in the past wasn't always consistent in enforcing those laws, but they were going to actually be consistent because they were laws on the books. So my question for you is, will you continue to enforce existing federal law on conscience issues when you get to HHS, and what will you do with the Conscience and Religious Freedom Division? Now, Senator, I hear, and by the way, thank you for the chance to respond to the question. It's a critical, important question. And, and I, I believe deeply in religious freedom. 
And I will make sure that as Secretary of HHS that you will know that I will not only respect the law when it comes to these issues of religious freedom, but I will enforce them as Secretary of HHS within my department. So the, the challenge that I have in just processing through this is some of the history there. When Obviously, when you were Attorney General, you had suits that went all the way to the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court overturned some of your decisions, specifically on conscience issues. For instance, the issue of the FACT Act that came out of California requiring uh, pro-life facilities have to post in their facility, here's a way to get an abortion instead of, ad of having your child up for adoption, which feels very much like promoting abortion, not just providing abortion. It's a very different issue on that. You argued that case all the way to the Supreme Court, ultimately lost because the Supreme Court said what's well, obvious to everyone. You can't require someone to say something they disagree with. That's a conscience issue. Another conscience issue was the Little Sisters of the Poor and other groups like that that said, hey, we, we don't want to participate in an abortion-related health care. And about 28,000 Californians lost their health care that fit in with their conscience based on how you were combating with those folks. So help me understand the disparity between those two. So, Senator, uh, again, it, it's important to provide clarity there. Uh, as you mentioned, I was in, in these cases, my job as the Attorney General is to defend the laws of our state. In the first case, you, you, you referenced a law in our state, uh, and which, by the way, had been upheld in court. It was ultimately overturned by the Supreme Court. As you, as you said, it was overturned, which means up until the Supreme Court, I had been defending the law of our state. In, this, in the second case, the actions we took with, were against the federal government. And once again, we were defending our state's laws and its rights under the law. Uh, some cases we've lost, some cases we've won. Where we have lost, I can assure you that right now California is following the rules that were provided to us by the, the Supreme Court. And so we'll always uh, abide by the law, but it's my obligation to also defend the laws. So you're going to be in this unique situation where you were litigating against HHS in these areas, and now you're going to have to flip and actually try to defend those areas. And I'm trying to figure out how that's going to fit for you and if there's a conflict of interest in that. So to clarify, and that's a great point, uh, and I think I say this for everyone to hear, um, I will have to abide by ethics rules. I, have, I will be signing an ethics agreement. There are certain cases, because I handled them as the Attorney General within California, I will have to recuse myself from certain cases where I was involved at the state level. Uh, and certainly, uh, because of the ethics agreement that I will have, there will be uh, always a check on what I'm doing to make sure that it doesn't somehow conflict with what I have done previously as the Attorney General. Yeah, this conscience issue is really important. For a health care provider who believes that a child is a child, whether they're in the womb or whether they're outside the womb, that's a child that God created and has value and worth. It's exceptionally important to be able to honor the conscience rights of that individual and they not be compelled to be able to perform an abortion or to participate in an assisted suicide or something where they have, they have a conscience issue with that. And this is going to be a very significant issue that you're going to face that in previous times, administrations just ignored and did not enforce. Senator, I hear you very clearly. And as I said, I will respect the law as HHS Secretary. There, there are um, multiple grants and aid that's out there uh, that there'll have to be decisions made over whether faith-based entities can get grants or aid at the same level as non-faith, <coughs> excuse me, non-faith-based en entities, <coughs> excuse me. Here's the challenge. In some previous administrations, if you're a faith-based entity, you were not allowed to participate, strictly because of your faith and the structure of that. The Supreme Court has now stepped in pretty clear decisions over the past several years to make it clear you can't discriminate someone on the basis of their faith. Will you make sure the grant and the aid proposals from HHS are equal for faith-based entities and non-faith-based entities for the same issues? Again, you raise the issue. That Regardless of what your perspective is, right, Where, wherever we all may fall on these issues, at the end of the day, we've got to make sure, at least I do, as the, if I'm fortunate to be the Secretary of HHS, I have to follow the law. And there I will tell you that we will make sure that we are following the law. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask for four different letters to be entered into the record that folks have sent to me and to other members of this uh, committee. Without objection, that's so ordered. Thank you. All right. Um, our next colleague is Senator Brown on the web, and I see Senator Daines here, so Senator Daines would follow Senator Brown. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, General Bassetta, good to see you. Thanks for your willingness to serve Secretary of HHS. Thanks for 
your commitment in your, through your whole career, because I've known you a long time, to reducing health disparities and, and, and prioritizing policies to address the social determinants of health. A number of communities in my state have passed resolutions declaring a racism, a public health crisis. Uh, I think it's important that we, we, that we, we know that the history of institutional racism uh, continues to impact health outcomes for communities. And I, um, it's particularly important that, that you uh, understand the urgent need to be intentional about your work. And I know you will be. So thank you for that. You. Uh, Cincinnati is home to uh, two CDC NIOSH facilities, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Um, they are unlike any facilities in the country, maybe in the world. Their, their focus is occupational injury, repetitive injury, occupational health, uh, generally uh, toxins in the workplace, all of that. In 2015, Secretary Burwell announced that HHS would be dedicating $110 million to consolidate and upgrade the current Cincinnati NIOSH facilities. They've, in various agreed degrees of disrepair, the way CDC was a, a half a generation ago. Um, CDC and, and GAO are currently undergoing site acquisition activities. I understand both the site purchase and a design build contract will be finalized this spring. It's moved entirely too slowly. There was indifference or worse from the previous administration. I, my request is simple to ask if you would work with Senator Portman and me to ensure this project continues to get the attention it deserves from HHS, including uh, the funding necessary to stay on track. You have my commitment to that. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, in, in recent years, Congress and HHS have expanded the scope of benefits available to those who are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans without doing the same thing for those individuals who choose to remain in traditional Medicare. We've added benefits, vision, dental. We removed barriers to care like the three-day stay rule for, skill, for uh, skilled nursing facility care for Medicare Advantage beneficiaries, but failed to extend, you know, that's the more privatized Medicare, if you will, but failed to extend those same advantages to those seniors that, that stay in traditional Medicare plans. And those seniors typically are a little older and a little sicker and a little poorer generally. The growing imbalance between the programs concerns me greatly, especially when the Medicare program has been spending more money per Medicare Advantage plan enrollees than on people who choose traditional Medicare, a, a relatively recent but inexorable move in that direction. Uh, my question, uh, General Bassetto, will you commit to using your authority to building to, to holding private insurers accountable in reining in those Medicare Advantage overpayments to insure taxpayers and all Medicare beneficiaries are getting their money's worth. Senator, I, you have my commitment uh, in terms of uh, dealing with Medicare. You're, you're right. We don't have the, the dollars to spare and to waste. And so what, in this process to trying to strengthen and improve Medicare, we have to make sure we're doing oversight and keeping everyone accountable. And so I absolutely agree that uh, that's going to be one of the principal responsibilities we have. We have to be good stewards of the uh, Medicare program, taxpayer dollars. And as you mentioned, with this three-day rule uh, for post-acute care, uh, there are ways that we have to make sure that we're keeping everyone honest, and I will make sure that there is a level playing field. Good. The, the level playing field here is so, so important. Um, in closing, one, one last point, Mr. Chair, General Bassetta. Um, I'd like to, I, would, I want to bring the prior, bring forward to you the whole, the issue of the priority of bringing down the high cost of prescription drugs. Let me share a story quickly with you from a constituent in Columbus, in Columbus area community called Pickerington from a young man named someone named Colton. He was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2014. When his insurance coverage changed two years later, he was forced to pay $1,200 every four weeks for the infusions that kept his disease in remission. I just want to read you his comments briefly. At the time of this cost increase, I was in college, was already feeling the financial burden of student debt. Budgets for students are already tight enough, but the immense increase in cost for my infusions left me in a very difficult position. Unfortunately, with the added financial burden for my infusions, I had to choose between affording the cost of my infusions or school. This decision wasn't a decision at all since I needed the infusions to stay alive. The unreasonable price of my prescriptions forced me to leave college. My life path, he writes, has been completely altered by expensive prescription drugs and drug company greed. I often feel like I'm behind all of the people my age, even people younger than I, 
because I've had to focus my time and my money on staying alive. We shouldn't have to give up on pursuing a college education because of critical med medical debt, crippling medical debt. We shouldn't have to make every financial decision with the cost of prescriptions and medical debt in the back of our minds. Things can be better if our leaders reign in drug company greed and make need, the needs of patients like me the priority. Uh, that's the end of this letter. Um, now's the time, uh, General, for, for meaningful reforms to bring down uh, drug prices. My question is simple. If confirmed, will you commit to working with me and other members of this committee, especially Chair Wyden, who's been so involved in this, to deliver real change that will make American prescription drugs more affordable? You have that commitment. Thank you, General. Thank you, uh, Chairman Wyden. Thank you, Senator Brown. We will be working on that. Senator Dane. Thank you, Chairman Wyden. Uh, Attorney General Becerra, I just want to be up front and tell you I, I've got serious concerns with the radical views that you've taken in the past on the issue of abortion, as well as one of our very important constitutional protection, that is religious liberty, frankly, a record that shows a disregard for that. Our present challenges demand an HHS secretary that is prepared to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and command a position of public trust. Uh, many Montanans, pro-life groups across the country have written to say that you've taken the most radical positions on this very important issue of life and on abortion. If you want to push back on that impression, I think you have an opportunity here to try to, uh, to gain some public trust uh, and to uh, take a look at the record you've had in California uh, and how you might uh, govern if you are approved here in Washington, D.C. Um, could you name one abortion restriction that you might support? Senator, let me, let me try to respond this way. Um, I have tried to make sure on this important issue for so many people, where oftentimes, again, we have different views, but deeply held views, that I have tried to make sure that I am abiding by the law. Because whether it's a particular restriction or whether it's the whole idea of abortion, uh, whether we agree or not, we have to come to some conclusion, and that's where the law gives but, us. But the is there to go. just to be clear? Is there any line you would draw? Is there just one, just one restriction, as it relates to abortion, so you're, that you're you might support? Senator, you're talking to the spouse of a. Uh, OBGYN who for decades has practiced saving lives of women and babies. And I can tell you that from the stories I've heard from Carolina, my wife, I know how hard many women struggle just to save the life of their baby. And so what I would say to you, and I know that right now as I speak, my mother has blessed me this morning as I got ready to come here. And last night I know when she prayed the rosary as she does every day, uh, every evening with my aunt, that she said a prayer and included me in that well, prayer. Well, you know, part of it's the battle for those who don't have a voice, which are the little babies. Um, I'll, I'll, and you didn't answer the question about any, even one, even one restriction on abortion. Um, I didn't get an answer from you. Let me just throw one out there. How about a ban on the lethal discrimination of babies who are diagnosed with Down syndrome? And so, Senator, you, once again, it, if I can simply say to you that I respect the different views that are out there, but what's important is that it makes sure that yeah, it's, but, but my but view you're, is according you're, you're to the law. Gonna, if you confirm, you're going to be the head of the HHS. It's a, it's a huge organization. It has profound impact on our society. How about a ban on sex-selective abortion? Whether, you, whether the little baby is a male or a female, would you say you can't have a sex-selective abortion? And I respect those who take a, a particular view. Uh, my job will be to make sure that I am following the law. There's a ban on partial birth abortion. I know that question came up yesterday. Is that um, yes or no? Would you support a ban on partial birth abortion? Again, Senator, you're asking questions which will touch on aspects that I know have different views. And what I can say is that I will make sure that I'm respecting the law on those issues. You've repeatedly intervened in court to revoke an important religious exemption to Obamacare's contraception mandate from people like the Little Sisters of the Poor, an order of Catholic nuns that serve the poor and are most vulnerable. And they have won at the Supreme Court. As HHS Secretary, would you commit to defending the existing regulatory exemptions to the contraceptive mandate, or will you seek to eliminate the exemption protecting the Little Sisters of the Poor from crippling government fines? 
Well, as you as you mentioned, the Supreme Court issued a, a ruling. We'll make sure, as if I'm fortunate to become Secretary of HHS, that we will abide by the law as it stands. And now, with this ruling from the sec uh, from so the you, Supreme you would Court. defend the existing mandate then per the court. I will I will defend the law and support the law that's in place. According to CDC data, uh, they've been comparing states and territories. Montana is ranked near the top for administration of the vaccine, but we fall near the bottom for first doses allocated by the federal government. That's why our congressional delegation wrote to President Biden expressing frustration that Montana isn't getting its fair share of vaccines. I'm concerned HHS is neglecting to reward states like Montana that could administer at least three times the number of doses being delivered currently. Do you believe HHS should provide additional vaccines to states like Montana, for example, who have been able to quickly and efficiently get vaccines in the arms of people who want them? Senator, we applaud states that are, are moving forward and being diligent in getting their people protected. And I know that President Biden has made the commitment to have all the vaccines that we'll need for, throughout the country. And what I can commit to you is to make sure we're working with you and the folks in Montana to make sure that the vaccines are there for the people of your state when they need them and doing that for the same, the same way for all the people in this, in this country. We want to make sure we're not missing anyone. And that's where this issue of pockets of th population. Th th thank you for that. I appreciate that answer. Um, last question. You're on record uh, for pushing for allowing illegal immigrants to receive taxpayer funded health care and for decriminalizing illegal entry in the United States. This coupled with President Biden's radical plan for granting citizenship to those who are here illegally would potentially lead to hundreds of thousands, if not potentially millions, more people flooding into our country. As you know, in 2016, California passed a law requiring covered California to apply for a Section 1332 waiver to allow illegal immigrants to purchase health insurance through the marketplace. This waiver was withdrawn after President Trump's election. My question is this, will you attempt to use the waiver authority containing the Affordable Care Act to grant health care benefits to illegal immigrants? Senator, what I can tell you is that uh, where the law uh, as it stands now, uh, as, as I see it, it does not allow those who are uh, unauthorized in this country to receive taxpayer paid benefits, except in very rare circumstances. And it will be my job to make sure that we are following and enforcing the law. And I can commit to you that that's what we will do. Thank you. Senator Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me turn to another. Uh, it's very nice to see you, Mr. Attorney General. Welcome back to Washington. Uh, and I want to turn to what was also called a radical plan, um, and that was the Affordable Care Act, which has made massive strides in providing health care to 20 million Americans, protecting people with pre-existing conditions from discrimination and a lot of other things that have become the norm in this country, uh, like staying on your parents' health insurance until you're 26, something you couldn't do before the Affordable Care Act was passed. I think we need to build on the Affordable Care Act uh, and use the Medicare system to provide a true public option. Uh, and it's something that the President has also talked about in his campaign. I believed in it when we passed the ACA to begin with. The votes weren't here to do it. I think it's become very clear during the course of the pandemic that nobody is served by having people that don't have primary access or to access to primary health care because you can see in the numbers in the pandemic what's happened to this country versus some other places. Last August, President, then a candidate Biden was speaking to one of my constituents from Colorado, Laura Packard, who was told, told the vice president at the time that um, she was re literally receiving chemotherapy on the day that there were some folks here trying to repeal the Affordable uh, Care Act. And she asked her what he was going to do for people like her and for, you know, people in America. And he told her, quote, we're going to provide a Medicare-like option as a public option. He went on I'm going to protect you like I try and protect my own family, and I promise you that. It was a powerful moment for all of us who were watching. And yesterday, Senator Tim Kaine and I uh, and some of my colleagues on this committee reintroduced the Medicare X Choice Act to create a true public option, increasing choice for consumers, starting in rural areas, reducing health care costs, and increasing affordability and quality of health insurance. We, we work to ensure that our updated legislation aligns with President Biden's plan, including plans offering primary care services without cost sharing, fixing the family 
glitch to increase access to premium support and ensuring that the cap on premiums for everyone above 400 percent of the federal poverty level is 8.5 percent of their income. Medicare X both finishes the work of the ACA and aligns with the President's objectives. You are uniquely situated, having been both a lawmaker and the California Attorney General, to help us get this across the finish line. And I just want to ask uh, what your thoughts are on, 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 on the, the commitments the President made on a public option during the campaign and, and how we can get it across the finish line so we can finally uh, fulfill the promise that every single American has access to health care in this country. Senator, you've, uh, you've pointed out where uh, now President Biden stood as candidate Biden, and he was very strong about this. He made it very clear that the Affordable Care Act is a strong foundation from which we can build. Uh, you've mentioned the public option. He made it very clear he's a supporter of uh, moving forward on a public option. Uh, my job will be to try to implement the President's agenda on health care, and so I will look forward to working with you and all of your colleagues to try to make sure we can continue to see more Americans access health care, whether through their employer or whether through Medicaid or whether through the uh, Affordable Care Act's uh, marketplaces. We need to have those options, including the public option, available if states want to move in that direction, we will try to be, we're, we'll work with them as best we can. But as you said, the goal here has to be to make things even better, more affordable for Americans. You know, I, I um, Mr. Chairman, I came up with the idea for this legislation after I was in a meeting in Jackson County, Colorado. And to give you a sense of Jackson County, um, I, I saw my friend from Indiana. I had to start the meeting by apologizing for how badly I had done in the election the last time because it is, you know, there are very few Democrats there. And somebody actually said, oh, you, you actually want a few more Democrats than there actually are. But it was, it was grim. But I was there and somebody said to me, you know, Michael, I moved back to this town. It's a county with, I think, fewer than a thousand people in it. Huge. I moved back to this town to take over the bowling alley that I loved to go to as a kid. And my, I'm working 50 hours a week. My wife is working 50 hours a week. Neither of us has health insurance. He said, my, 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 I've got people I want to hire, but I can't hire people because they have to give up their welfare to come work for me. I said, what do you mean their welfare? He said, their Medicaid. In other words, their health care. So here in America, this is after the Affordable Care Act was passed, here we have a situation where a small business owner and his wife are working 50 hours a week. They can't afford health insurance. Folks that would want to come work can't come work because they have to give up their insurance. How can we defend a system like that? And we don't need to. And I think, I hope we look back at the history of all of that and find a way to put the partisanship aside and actually provide the American people with just what this is, an option. They can choose. They can choose. All over rural and urban Colorado, it would be a choice. If you want to stay with your private insurance, stay with it. If you want a public option administered by Medicare, you can have that too. And um, I think that's going to be a powerful argument for the American people who, coming out of this pandemic, want more choices, not fewer. So I'm very glad you've been nominated, and I look forward to supporting your nomination and, and working with you to, to deliver this for the American people. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bennett. Senator Young. Mr. Becerra, there are, there are all sorts of concerns uh, by my constituents and, and uh, I think every American about getting shots in the arms as quickly as possible. Uh, that is uh, our, my foremost uh, objective in, in trying to support uh, the administration uh, in furtherance of that goal. Um, the Biden administration just announced the launch of two new federal programs, uh, the Federal Retail Pharmacy Program and the Community Health Center's Vaccination Program. This was an effort to speed up vaccinations across the country. Yes. These programs are in addition to an existing program, which is uh, the Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Program. Unfortunately, um, these, these various programs are causing some confusion for the states, as the states aren't able to oversee and coordinate distribution of our already limited supply of vaccine with uh, these various entities, long-term care facilities, community health centers, retail pharmacies, and, and, and individual Hoosiers are confused as well because now they have to sign up in multiple places in order to become vaccinated. In fact, the National Governors, Governors Association recently 
uh, wrote to the administration highlighting this issue, indicating, quote, uh, if the federal government distributes independently of the states to these same entities without state coordination and consultation, redundancy and inefficiency may very well follow, unquote. Uh, I'd like to submit uh, two letters for the record, one from the NGA and one from my home state of Indiana, uh, further detailing these concerns. Mr. With, without objection, so ordered. So, I bring this to your attention because uh, until adequate supply is available, Mr. Becerra, the administration should be working with states on vaccine distribution, especially since retail pharmacies and, and federally qualified health centers are already part of many states' vaccine plans. And the state of Indiana has, has, has been making uh, great strides uh, with the available vaccine to, to get into the arms of Hoosiers. So, um, uh, do you commit to working with the states before announcing major program rollouts like uh, the two I mentioned in the future? And, and Senator, you'll understand why this is close to my gut more than my heart, because I'm a state official right now, and we've had to administer a lot of these programs. I've had to defend many of these programs in our state level in court. And what I will say to you is that if we're not doing a good job of coordinating with our state and local and tribal and territorial partners, then we're not doing, what we, doing it as well as we can. And so I am committed to working with you to make sure that as we get the product out, and fortunately, President Biden has made an aggressive effort to make sure we have enough vaccines for everyone, that we're working with all those who have to make sure that shot actually gets into the arm. So that's an encouraging response. Let me go further. Sure. Would you allow states like Indiana, who may well find these programs counterproductive to our shared goals of getting vaccine into arms to opt out of these federal programs until a time where there's adequate supply available. So let me, I, I, I'm not that y yet there, and I hope to be confirmed, but I, it'd be tough, Senator, to be honest with you. To Would you it consider the, it? I, absolutely. We'll sit down with you and talk. If, the moment I am on, in that seat, I will Make sure that we are sitting together. Or we'll go to your office and we'll talk about this. Can you conceive of a reason why you wouldn't allow a state like Indiana to opt out of these programs? I, I will tell you that the president's goals are ambitious. We want to move quickly. Uh, I can't understand why we wouldn't want to always co coordinate, but I also want to make sure it's clear that the president has been very, very uh, transparent in saying that we want to make sure we're reaching everyone. We're doing it in a fair way, okay. and we're doing it in a court. You know, it's, it makes sense. I'm going to cut you off because you know how this goes. i got a limited time. Yes. Um, uh, but I would, I would hope you would allow states like Indiana to opt out if, if uh, that will help us uh, get more vaccine in the arm of Hoosiers. So 33 Americans uh, die every day waiting for a life-saving organ transplant. We have an organ shortage in this country, and it results from a severe lack of oversight and accountability among government monopoly organ. contractors yeah. that run our organ donation system. These are known as organ procurement organizations, or OPOs. The Senate Finance Committee recently noted that uh, our organ donation system uh, uh, has been severely underperforming for decades. Department of Health and Human Services finalized a rule last November that would allow HHS to hold OPOs accountable for their performance for the first time in its 40-year history. Um, this rule is projected to save more than 7,000 additional lives every year, and it's going to save money, too, over a billion dollars annually to Medicare. Uh, but because this rule was finalized in the last 60 days of the previous administration, you know where I'm headed with this. It's currently being subjected to the Biden administration freeze on midnight regulations. So as HHS Secretary, uh, will you commit to implementing and enforcing the November 2020 OPO final rule swiftly and forcefully as soon as the review period ends? So first, I got to say thank you for the role you played on organ donation. Uh, it's critical. It's not a subject everyone wants to take on. Secondly, uh, there's a pause. The, the pause that the president put on a number of, of these rules is something that most administrations do, but I can guarantee you that the administration, if I'm fortunate to be uh, confirmed, HHS will work quickly to try to get back up to speed on some of these uh, different rules. What I can commit to you is this, is we all know we need to increase the supply. 
We know we have to be fair. We have to make sure we're doing this in a way that makes sense, and we have to do the oversight. And so I can commit to you to work with you to make sure that if I, once I get in the chair, if I'm fortunate to be confirmed, that we will talk to you about how we move forward with that rule and, of course, your legislation as well. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Let me also say um, to my colleague and uh, to those following this, I think these are very important issues. And we have had a bipartisan inquiry going on in this committee where uh, uh, our colleague has been very actively involved. We will be continuing that. It is um, really high priority matter. And uh, my colleague has laid out some of the problems and we're gonna wanna get into the details. I believe when the uh, uh, Attorney General is confirmed and I was appreciative of his positive answers. So I thank you. Let's do this. Um, if there are any senators waiting in the queue uh, on the web, we will take one more before we go and vote. And then otherwise, per an agreement uh, with both sides, we'll take a 15 minute recess, uh, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, are any of my colleagues waiting on the web to uh, ask questions? All right, I gather not so. It is uh, a little after four. Well, it will take 15 uh, minutes and we'll have a recess and uh, we'll, we'll be back at that, at that point. Oh, Senator Casey. Okay. Senator Casey, you're out there in cyberspace somewhere? <laughs> I didn't think I'd have a chance, Ron. Terrific. Mr. Chair. <laughs> Terrific. Okay. So much we will revise the... Um, state of play here, and we will hear from uh, Senator Casey, and after he has completed his questions, then we will take a 15-minute uh, break, and that is in accord with the wishes of both the majority and the minority. Senator Casey. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think I may have jumped ahead, so this, I want the Attorney General to know this has never happened before. <laughs> so let me use my time wisely. Mr. Attorney General, thank you again for your public service and your willingness to continue public service on behalf of the nation uh, by running a major agency of our government that's so important these days, and that's the Department of Health and Human Services. And I also want to thank you for the commitment of your family, which I know is a major commitment by any family when you're in public service like you've been all these years. And yours is a great American story. I wanted to start with uh, the issue of home and community-based services. We know that one of the real tragedies within the, the larger tragedy of the pandemic, now that we've reached that awful, awful number of 500,000 deaths, is a high percentage of those deaths, at, at last count more than 170,000 residents and workers dying of the virus uh, who were in nursing homes, living or working in nursing homes or other long-term care settings. One way to protect these populations with um, a responsive, is I should say, is with a responsive and robust support system that provides quality home and community-based services. We know that those who do this work uh, in the home or home and community-based services, as well as in the long-term care setting, are frontline workers, they're heroic. And the folks who do this work support older, older, older adults uh, in our communities, and they also support and provide care for uh, folks with disabilities who need that help. They're often paid about $12 an hour for this essential work. Most of them, uh, a high percentage of them are women of color. And because these home and community-based services are not required under Medicaid, uh, under current law, there's over 800,000 people on waiting lists for these services, 16,000 of those in Pennsylvania. So we need to invest in this, this option uh, that we haven't really made part of Medicaid in a substantial way other than the, the waiver program. Uh, we need to invest now. The House uh, legislation, uh, their, their COVID-19 bill has over $9 billion. This is but a foot in the door, but a very important, unprecedented uh, foot in the door. Uh, so I have two questions for you. First, upon the passage, and I'm being optimistic here, but I think it'll happen, the passage of this emergency funding legislation, uh, COVID-19 legislation, as well as the funding for home and community-based services, will you work to distribute it to the states as quickly as possible? You've got my commitment, Senator. 
Thank you. And then secondly, as you know, the next, um, the next matter for President Biden and Vice President Harris is to work on the uh, Build Back Better plan. And that's another opportunity, I think, for us to really focus on this issue, but provide an even more substantial investment in home and community-based services. And I hope you would work with us to secure that funding. You've got my commitment again to work with you on that. The last issue in, in my remaining time is Medicaid. I, I don't have to tell you because you've been a strong uh, supporter and a, and a fighter uh, to preserve Medicaid funding. Medicaid in so many ways isn't some program. It's, it tells us who we are. It tells us who we are and tells us whom we value, whether it's kids or, or, or seniors or people with disabilities. So many millions of Americans, 70 million plus at last count, uh, have the benefit of Medicaid. You, you were familiar with when we sat down most recently and in our last hearing in the HELP Committee with my uh, agenda for children and the five freedoms for America's children. I believe every child uh, at birth, if they don't have health care coverage, should be covered by Medicaid. And I just want to ask you, how will you use your authority as HHS secretary to utilize waiver authority and other tools to strengthen Medicaid and to help expand coverage to uninsured or underinsured Americans? Senator, I know you know this, so I'm, I'm, I'm just repeating what you've already worked on so much, and that is Medicaid as the lifeline. It is what's kept so many American families from losing all hope and in many cases losing respect. And so I, I am absolutely uh, prepared to work with you and many of your colleagues to try to do what we can to strengthen Medicaid because uh, for so many, including seniors who have Medicare, who oftentimes rely on Medicaid as well, uh, we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of how important Medicaid has become to the entire population. And with uh, uh, the President's commitment to continue to build on the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid, as you know, is indispensable. So ready to work with you on any issues, especially for children. And I know my wife is applauding uh, everything you've just said to try to make sure our children have opportunities from the get-go. Thanks so much. We look forward to your confirmation. Thank you, Senator Casey. We're calling Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're calling some audibles here, and uh, with the consent of both sides, we'll have Senator Whitehouse, and then all other senators should know we're going to take a 15-minute break, and uh, then we will finish. Senator Whitehouse. Welcome, Attorney General. Senator. It's great to see you, and I wish you every success in the remaining days of your confirmation process. Um, I want to mention two things to you that uh, I've put a lot of work into over time. One is delivery system reform in our health care system. Macro, we hit the Medicare trust fund in 2024, um, and so we're going to have to deal with that issue uh, between now and then. Micro, Rhode Island has two of the best accountable care organizations in the country. These are primary care provider groups, doctors' practices, that have got together early, signed up as ACOs under the Affordable Care Act, and have changed the way they practice. And as a result, their cost per patient is coming down. Their patient satisfaction is through the roof. Their outcomes are improving. And they're sending checks back to the federal government out of the shared savings that they've been able to uh, obtain. Um, my staff person will hand you a little graph that I've got a big copy of right here, which is something that I've worked on for a while as time has gone by. In the far left here, time begins uh, around the time we passed Obamacare. And at that point, CBO projected what federal health care spending was going to look like. And their projection then is that top line. But in fact, with Obamacare law, we didn't follow that trajectory. Costs were actually lower. And as we've gone forward, we've experienced actual costs that are that bottom line. And the current projection, matching that original one from 12 years ago, I guess now, pushes out from where we are right now out 10 years. But if you took that same projection and put it onto where we were before, 
here's this gap between what was predicted and what we've achieved. And in the next 10 years, that gap is $6 trillion. Something changed from what was anticipated at the time we passed Obamacare, and the savings in the next decade are going to be $6 trillion from whatever that thing was that changed. I think that what changed was getting away from fee-for-service, getting providers engaged in accountable care organizations, and the emphasis on quality and reducing medical errors and dealing with uh, patients better. So um, I've had my rows with the Obama administration over how they were doing ACOs, and I've had my rows with the um, Trump administration. And I want to work with you to make sure that these organizations that are basically breaking trail for the rest of the healthcare system, these leadership ACOs are getting the support and the encouragement that they need because when they win, we win. And with Medicare trust fund starting to hit its limit looming, we got to get serious about that. And, uh, I don't need a long response from you now, but I want to make sure you're aware of um, the opportunities for delivery system reform. And I know you've got some very good ACOs in California as well. Yes. And Senator, if there's a response there, it's, I'm looking forward to working with you on it. We will, because we've got work to do. Um, it's also very likely a big political win-win. I don't know anybody on any side of any aisle in Washington who doesn't want better care, producing lower costs with happier patients. Um, last point, this is a bit of a personal thing. I've been working for a long time on, on having us treat people at the end of their lives better than we do, making sure that their choices are respected, making sure that their capability to be at home at that time is respected, making sure that they're pulled out of the health hospital treadmill and they aren't dying in intensive care units that they don't want to be in and shouldn't be in. Um, we've worked with CMMI a lot on that, and I'm hoping that we can close out under your leadership through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation a pilot program that will show that when you treat people at the end of their lives with more humanity, everybody's happier and it saves money. Will you work with me on that? As, as someone who had his father lived with him the last three years of his life so that when he passed, he passed in his bed in my home. Uh, I, absolutely. I look forward to working with you on that. You and I have had the same experience then. Thank you, sir, and Godspeed in your, in your confirmation. Thank you, Senator. Thank uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Attorney General. We'll take a 15-minute break. Thank you.
And I look forward to getting you live. Unless somebody unexpected comes. Yes. Uh, and here's Senator Crystal. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the duration. All right. You talk to him. The committee will come to order, and the tentative order of senators will be Senator Cortez Mastow on the web and Senator Warren um, in person. So uh, that may be subject to a change if someone who was here earlier and didn't come, but I believe that's the case. Senator Cortez Mastow. Are you out there in cyberspace? Okay, we will go to Senator Warren, and then we will go to Senator Sass. Let's see. Are you ready for me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, let me just, we're, yeah, why don't you go and then we'll sort out where we are after that. Senator Warren. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So early in the pandemic, Representative Ayanna Presley and I, along with many of our colleagues, pushed the Trump administration 
to collect and to publicly release demographic information on who was getting tested for COVID-19 and who was getting infected. Without this information, there would be no way to know if black, brown, and indigenous communities had the same access to tests as white communities, and it would be impossible for the federal government to allocate resources equitably. Put plainly, you can't fix what you can't see. Now, we kept pushing and mandated this data collection in one of the COVID relief packages, and now we've begun to get a fuller picture. We know that black, Latino, and indigenous people are nearly two times as likely to contract COVID-19, roughly four times more likely to be hospitalized when they get sick, and more than twice as likely to die. Those data are critical to setting policies to combat racial inequality, but today, almost a year into the pandemic, nearly half of all testing data collected by the CDC still does not have associated race or ethnicity information. As HHS Secretary, will you commit to prioritizing collecting and reporting these critical data so that we get a fuller picture of how the virus is affecting all Americans. Senator, first, uh, thank you for making that effort to secure that information. I can make the commitment to you now that I will work with you to make sure we have all of that type of information. We need that information to do a good job. Good. I'm glad to hear you say that. Now, on the vaccine front, we have administered over 64 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, but the CDC has race and ethnicity information for just over half of those vaccines. So if confirmed, will you also commit to improving the collection and publishing of the data on vaccines? I commit to work with you to make that happen. That's terrific. You know, there's more though. Racial equity should be a part of every public health issue that you approach as HHS Secretary. Chronic conditions, infant and maternal mortality, addiction, police brutality, racial health disparities aren't coincidences or aberrations in the data. They result from structural racism, and it's time to start treating structural racism like any other public health problem investing in research into its symptoms and its causes and finding ways to mitigate its effects. So let me ask you the third in this series, will you commit to collecting the data we need to see the racial disparities in our healthcare system and to attacking those disparities head on? Senator, I'm looking forward to working on that with you because it's time. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to working with you, and I'm going to support this nomination all the way. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank our, our colleague. <clears throat> Senator Cortez Mastow, I believe, is next. Thank you. I am here. General Becerra, congratulations on your nomination. Thank you. Very excited for you and your family. Let, let me start with an issue that I've been focused on uh, for the state of Nevada. Many of us um, really have been talking about putting in uh, the most recent package. First, I want to thank the administration for the work that went into President Biden's American Rescue Plan to provide COVID-19 relief to millions of families across the country. Still a need for it out there, including in Nevada, it's been so hard hit. So many of the provisions in the plan are critical to getting Americans back on their feet. But I'd like to focus on the COBRA subsidies that will be a lifeline to out-of-work Nevadans. Nevada's tourism-driven economy was devastated by the coronavirus. The losses suffered by our gaming and hospitality sectors have taken a toll on hardworking families across the Silver State. These families have experienced layoffs or seen their hours cut. They've lost steady wages, they've experienced food and housing insecurity, and they've lost their health care. The rescue plan includes measures to address each one of these issues, but COBRA subsidies are especially critical because they are key to preserving the benefits that union workers have fought for. They're essential to protecting coverage for whole families and ensuring access to their doctors and specialists. So, uh, General Becerra, I know you understand how essential these benefits are to working families. Can we count on you to help us protect these hard-fought benefits that will help 
Nevada families and families stay afloat through this crisis and beyond. Senator, you have my commitment because you're talking about having a continuity of coverage for people who were working, oftentimes had their coverage because of their work or through their union, uh, through no fault of their own. Now they find themse themselves in these conditions. And so absolutely, you have my commitment to work with you on this. Thank you. And then I want to touch on another subject that my colleagues, Senators White and Stabenow, have talked about, which is mental health. As we have seen, this pandemic has shown uh, really a bright light on the mental health needs of American families, from seniors struggling with loneliness to young students navigating an online learning environment, from those with a history of substance abuse or serious mental illness who've been thrown off track by the radical change in their daily life, to families facing the trauma of job loss and poverty, everyone is hurting. We have had and made a huge uh, effort last year to incorporate funding for mental health support in the various coronavirus coronavirus relief packages. Um, but let me just say this, block grants and patchwork funding are no way to sustain the mental health infrastructure that the nation needs over the long term. Uh, we should see the pandemic as an opportunity to build an even stronger support system for American families. And that's why I've been working on legislation that builds on Senator White's uh, Senator Wyden's Cahoots Act uh, to bolster behavioral health crisis response services across the country. It integrates Senator Stabenow, Stabenow's certified community behavioral health services. Uh, and so I look forward to working with you on this legislation that will build on SAMHSA's guidelines to create a framework for providing emergency mental health services to individuals in crisis. You know better than anyone with your, with your broad experience uh, particularly is, is the most recent uh, Attorney General of California. There is a need for this, and we just have to get it right moving forward. So can I count on your support in working with us to address mental health and behavioral health services in the state across the country? Senator, for the reasons you've just articulated, I started a disability rights unit in the Department of Justice in California, and I am absolutely looking forward to working with you on these issues. Wonderful. And then lastly, let me just put this on your radar. I, I just, I'd like to underscore the imperative that, I, that HHS focus on improvements to the Indian Health Services. Uh, we are we're in bipartisan agreement here in Congress that uh, the service is in dire need of additional stable funding in order to meet the basic needs of Indian country. Many of us also sit on Senate Indian Affairs, and this is crucial and critical that we have your support. Uh, you know, the crisis at IHS is years in the making. And so can I get a commitment from you that, um, listen, that we can work with you, that you're willing even to come to the Committee of Senate Indian Affairs and talk with us about um, how we address and improve upon Indian health service in this country? Absolutely, you have that commitment. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Cassidy is next. Hello, General Becerra. Again, um, uh, good to see you. Uh, General Becerra, I, if I had to guess, if I was a betting man, I'd bet that you got the votes to be approved. Um, but as I mentioned yesterday in the health committee, my concern is that you're in, far, in the, the largest domestic agency and you don't have the background. Now, your answers have been typically you have been general, and I have no doubt that you'll have good advisors. But as I said yesterday, I'm a physician. Should I be the attorney general of the United States? Obviously, the answer is no. So, but, but. But, you know, there's three major buckets of HHS. One bucket is the TANF for the social services. The other is the financing, the Medicare, Medicaid. And the third is what we discussed that help those kind of FDA, uh, NIH, and other bucket, if you will. And those are the three big ones, and everything else is far less. So just to kind of explore, because um, as Senator Burr said yesterday, this is kind of your opportunity to introduce yourself to the American people and to say, nope, I got it. I'm ready. I don't know everything, but I know enough that you don't have somebody coming in who's unfamiliar with um, what might be happening. So let me just ask a couple things. TANF is a program that will be under your administration. And can you just talk, and, and you've spoken about <clears throat> enforcing existing laws. So knowing the goals of the TANF program, what could we do to more specifically to address those specific goals as laid out in statute for TANF? 
So, Senator, thanks very much for the uh, the chance to answer the question. And, and by the way, thank you very much for the time you gave me to sit down and talk about a number of issues. Uh, what I can tell you is if we're talking about children and families, uh, HHS can do a whole lot to make sure that whether it's nutritional goals, whether it's the health status, or whether it's making sure, sure that we're talking about wellness, not just about remedy uh, conditions, that we are working with all of our sister agencies and with our state and local partners to make sure that we are trying to improve the condition of life for these families, especially families. If I may, because I have limited time, to the specific statute, the statute says specifically uh, the, the, among those four goals, but to reduce out of wedlock pregnancies, to promote the formation and maintenance of two parent families, to end dependence on government benefits through work, job preparation and marriage, and then to provide assistance to needy families with children so they can live in their own homes or the homes of relatives. So what specifically about those goals, because this is part of one of those big three buckets that you'll be administering, would you bring to the table as part of sort of a policy solution? Having been someone who had the benefit of having two loving parents and had a chance to be raised by people who always worked hard and gave me the best example, I certainly believe that one of the things that we can do is continue to strive to give all of our children the opportunity to be raised in a loving home and with an opportunity to succeed. So, so, General, so General, that's the goal of the program. That's the statute. I guess uh, the, the, the question is what experience or what specific programs or what critique of existing programs would you offer in order to better meet that goal? Again, something that uh, HHS Secretary will be responsible for. Well, certainly I think there's always a need to try to improve on the different programs. We always learn every year of how we can make them better. We learn of inefficiencies or bureaucracies that sometimes get in the way. Uh, if I'm fortunate to be confirmed, uh, I certainly will take a close look, and with your help and the oversight that you all do, I hope what we can do is improve these programs and, and have in place the roadmap, whether through statute or through regulation, that lets us advance the interests of these families. So then the third bucket is the financing, which is the Medicaid and Medicare program. And we've talked about a lot of things in this committee. You've been on uh, Ways and Means, and we're involved in the Medicare modernization, so this might be more in your wheelhouse. But just one issue that we have discussed, Medicare and beneficiaries and an increasing Medicare beneficiaries, an increasing share of commercial enrollees pay coinsurance based upon the list price of a drug. So if the pharmaceutical company drives up the list price to give a bigger rebate to a pharmacy benefit manager, the net price may be lower for the PBM but the patient is paying based on the list price. What steps could HHS take to protect the patient in this situation? Well, here we have to look at this from the perspective of the patient. And I know that there are a number of things going on right now with the rebate program. And rather than let patients, uh, Medicare beneficiaries, get embroiled in the, in the food fight between PBMs and drug makers, we have to make sure that we agree, all of us agree, that whatever we're going to do, whether it's on rebates or anything having to do with prescription drugs, we're letting our seniors on Medicare know that we're going to fight to lower the price. And so uh, without getting into the specifics of the, the, the different uh, fights that are going on between the different uh, providers and, and those that are involved, the stakeholders, what I can tell you is that uh, we will do the oversight. Uh, there are, in some cases, existing regulations that tell us how to proceed. Uh, with regard to the rebates, uh, there is existing authority. And what we can do is make sure that no one's trying to game the system, that at the end of the day, we're looking for lower prices on the prescription drugs that our seniors count on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank, I thank my colleague, and I look forward to work, working with him. Senator, Senator Sass, the three remaining senators that we have are Senator Sass, Senator Hassan, and Senator Portman. Senator Sass. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Becerra, you said a little while ago that you never sued the nuns, which is a pretty interesting way of reframing your bullying. Um, you actually sued the federal government, who had given an exemption to the nuns. Can you explain to us what the Little Sisters of the Poor were doing wrong? So, Senator, as I try to explain, my, my actions were against the federal government. It's not, not, not the Little Sisters of the Poor, we never alleged that the Little Sisters of the Poor did anything wrong. Our, our problem was that the federal government was not uh, abiding by the law as we saw it, 
And what we did was we took action against the federal government so California could administer its programs to make sure that the Affordable Care Act continued to work. What were, what were the nuns doing that made it impossible for California to administer their program? That was just a complete nonsense answer. Uh, what, what were the nuns doing that it made it difficult for California to administer your program? Well, as I said, Senator, our action was against the federal government. It's what the No, no, you, you continued and you said, so that California could administer your program. What did the nuns do? that made it difficult for California to administer their program. And, and Senator, what I'm trying to explain to you is that it, we, we, didn't, we were not looking at the actions of the Little Sisters or any other uh, program. Our actions were against the federal government and the way it was applying the law as it existed to California. But, but what did the federal government do? It was about the nuns. This is but, nonsense. Like what you're saying isn't true. You say you didn't sue the nuns, you sued the federal government that was keeping you from making sure that the nuns had to buy contraceptive insurance. Were the nuns going to get pregnant? Senator, the actions of a state of California, and I was defending the, the actions of our state and the laws that were in place, the federal government took actions, changed the way that we would administer the programs that we had under the Affordable Care Act. Our actions related to how providers are providing services to the people of California. When the federal government took action that we thought was unlawful, we took action to protect the people of California. So again, a whole bunch of words, um, but you know well, you're an incredibly smart man, you know well that what the federal government did was make sure that you couldn't target the nuns. So you sued the federal government because the federal government said the nuns didn't have to buy contraceptive insurance. You can put 17 layers of, you were following the law to go after the federal government for administering the program or doing X or doing Y that made it difficult for you to, for California to administer the program, but it was just about nuns buying contraceptive coverage. Was there something else the federal government did that you were suing them for when, when in the case called California versus Little Sisters of the Poor? Senator, the, the case was not again, that, that was not the name of the case. And what I will tell you is that our actions were based on trying to follow the law. That when the federal government took action, which we believe did not comport with the law, at that point we took action. And our action was based on the law. And so, as I've said, we, we may disagree on how we see this. And I respect the differences that we may have. But my action was to follow the law. What about the law? as the federal government's conscious, conscience exceptions applied in the case where you sued the federal government. What about the law applied to anybody except the nuns and other similarly situated religious institutions? Uh, you were targeting religious liberty. Senator, let me see if I can try to answer. Um, the Affordable Care Act tries to make sure that we are providing health care to all Americans. And we have to make sure that we provide the services that Americans uh, are entitled to receive. We tried to make sure that in California, under the Affordable Care Act, every Californian receives the benefits they're entitled to under the, that act. And so when we saw that the federal government was taking actions which might abridge those rights. And someone asked the question again. You said the federal government taking actions. This is the third time you haven't answered. Were any of those actions about anything except nuns and religious liberty? Was the federal government taking other actions that you were suing about in that case? Or was it just because you wanted to target the nuns and religious liberty? Senator, I, again, I, I respect the way you view it, but from the because perspective- Because it's actually what happened. Well, Senator, I, I, again, I, I understand that we may view it differently, but I was trying to protect access to care- I'm giving you the chance to explain what do you think it was about if it wasn't this. And you've not yet explained any party except the law is administered by the federal government, but it was about the nuns. Yes. Senator, I'll try once again to explain. Californians are entitled under the Affordable Care Act to access care. And the nuns Act were keeping them from getting hair, care how? The federal government was changing the, 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 the to, way To they make sure that the religious liberty rights of the nuns were protected. Was there anything else the federal government was doing except making sure the nuns had religious liberty? I, Senator, I, I respect the differences in the, the way you view this. For the fifth time, you've not answered the question. I've, I've asked you for any party besides the nuns, and you've, never, you've just said you respected diversity of opinions. But I'll move on to another question. Uh, former abortion industry employees, employees from your state have claimed on camera that babies who survived abortions were left to die by Planned Parenthood staff in your state in clear violation of both state and federal law. Instead of investigating these claims, you raided the houses of the filmmakers who brought these atrocities to light. Why did you do that? 
Senator, uh, again, I respect uh, the way you framed it. Uh, I would say to you that it's clear that we have, we look at it differently. California has privacy laws. Uh, we enforce privacy laws. Uh, when we take action based on violation of privacy laws, it's because we have evidence that the rights of Californians to their privacy has been violated. Uh, you've described it differently, but what I will say to you is my job is to follow the law and make sure others do as well. And so in this case, I think what you're good. saying is the, the baby body parts weren't interesting, let, but the filming of it was. Let, but in 2014 and 2015 the, the at Senate, California Senate, Poultry the Farms. The senator from Nebraska senator, is over his time, and his colleague, Senator Barrasso, is next and two others. Can I ask my colleague if he minds if I go for 45 seconds? Sure. Thank okay. you, With Senator 40, 45 seconds, and thank, that's it. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in 2014 and 2015, California Poultry Farms um, were recorded secretly showing inhumane treatment of animals in California. Did you investigate the filmmakers of the poultry farm filmings? In what years? Uh, 2014 and 2015. Senator, I was not the Attorney General. The, and the time of the gentleman's expired. Senator from Wyoming. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for taking time to visit by phone, and uh, we all value your willingness to serve our country. Uh, you know, you, you started the testimony referring to the painful impact of coronavirus on all of us. Uh, rural communities, as we talked, uh, are facing significant challenges, especially as a result of the pandemic. We talked about rural health needs and getting physicians and training into, into rural communities. You know, a doctor who practiced in Wyoming for over two decades, I'm very interested and focused on protecting and improving health care in, in rural America. Uh, the uh, one aspect of health care that's often overlooked are the, the many factors outside of direct patient care that impact the health of individuals. Uh, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, social determinants of health have a major impact on people's health, well-being, and quality of life. And that when you were in the House of Representatives, you actually helped draft legislation requiring the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which you're now nominated to serve, to conduct research on social determinants of health in Medicare's value-based programs. So then you agree that social determinants of health, such as employment, educational opportunity, uh, all strongly impact the health of individuals. Uh, chronic unemployment is, is harmful at a high rate. And that's, and that's why I'm so bothered that one of the first actions taken by the Biden administration was a ban on oil and gas leasing. And the impact of that on jobs in my state are just devastating. Uh, it's killing jobs, it's killing hope in communities, people are worried about raising unemployment rates, and all of the issues that, that, that come along with that. Uh, uh, the, uh, these industries create thousands of jobs, contribute hundreds of millions of dollars to states, and the, the states that the money is used, education for schools, for students, and helping hospitals stay open and stay viable in these communities. Uh, and it, it's the, the Biden administration's decision is clearly going to have a terrible impact, I believe, on health and well-being of communities in Wyoming and across rural America. But it's, it's, uh, that, and it's a decision made by executive order day one. Uh, do you agree that cutting hundreds of millions of dollars from hospitals and schools is going to have an impact on health in rural communities? Oh, Senator, I, what, well, first, thank you for the question, uh, and thank you for the chance to chat by phone. Um, Any time a community is impacted where it loses jobs, it loses access to care and good schools, uh, it, you're going to see impacts. And so I think we all want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to make sure that every family, wherever they locate, has the opportunities that we expect in America. The... Um I'm going to talk about what's happening also with the pandemic, especially how it's impacted seniors, um, other vulnerable people living in nursing facilities in terms of my home state of Wyoming. Large proportion of people who've lost their lives to coronavirus have, done, have been patients in nursing homes. That's where it struck first within the state and continues. Uh, from a public health perspective, I think it's important for states and local governments to accurately report information regarding the impact of coronavirus. And, you know, unfortunately, it's clear now that the state of New York not only failed to report accurate data regarding nursing home deaths, but likely deliberately misled the public. The, according to the Attorney General of New York, and I don't know if that's someone you've worked with because you're still Attorney General of California, uh, the Attorney General of New York says the state undercounted deaths from coronavirus in nursing homes by up to 50 percent. So do you believe it's important for states to accurately report public health data, especially deaths from, from coronavirus? Senator, I, I think it's important that all of us 
do the work to make sure that our data reflects the facts and that the, the data is in used in appropriate ways so we can make decisions on how to move forward. Yeah. So given this glaring evidence that is presented by the New York Attorney General, um, as Secretary, will you advocate that the Biden administration fully investigate what occurred in this situation? Senator, I know the uh, Attorney General in New York very, very well. The AG James is a, a tremendous uh, advocate for her state. Uh, but I don't know the facts in that particular case, and it would be difficult for me to comment. The, the other issue that, we, that you and I talked about, graduate medical education, and you, and you and I have similar situations. You in California know that the majority of the money goes to the big cities. Doctors train there. And we talked about your, your wife is a, who is a physician. Uh, most people practice medicine within 50 miles of where they do their training. And so little of the money goes to the 26 states that have the greatest needs in terms of underserved communities. And I don't know if you've had a chance to give additional thought uh, to that, but it's critical that we get a redistribution of the money if we're going to get a redistribution of where physicians practice in America because they tend to stay pretty close to the area where they train. Senator, you, you, you brought a very good, up a very good point because um, I, I think that the, the data will bear what you set out that oftentimes once you find yourself in a, in a residency program, you end up sticking around pretty close. Uh, you start to meet people. Sometimes you meet your spouse and you establish families. And so I think it is important that we make sure that no community in, in the country is not considered when it comes to the opportunity to have these tremendously important professionals like you, my, like my wife, who provide care to our families. And so I am more than willing to, to work closely with you on that because I, I think it would be a mistake if we allowed the, the real professionals that, who have been champions in this COVID pandemic to not be spread throughout the country. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank my colleague. Senator Toomey's on the web. And then we will have Senator Hassan and Portman, and that will be it. It's been a long afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you hear you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Attorney General Becerra, uh, welcome, and thanks for your willingness to serve. Um, I wanted to zero in on one particular health care policy that you have advocated for and which I find very, very disturbing. And specifically, I'm referring to the use of the so-called marching rights by the federal government to basically confiscate the intellectual property of a private company. You sent a letter to Dr. Francis Collins, uh, the director of the NIH and former commissioner of the FDA, Stephen Hahn, demanding that the government use these so-called marching rights to steal the legal rights to Gilead's uh, product in this case, it was remdesivir, and give it to a third party to manufacture. The letter was sent just last August, August 4th, 2020, so just a few months ago. In the midst, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, and just a few months after this, perhaps life-saving treatment was approved by the FDA for emergency use in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And it was almost an entire month before the FDA expanded the authorized use no longer limiting it to patients with severe disease. And the reason that you cited in the letter was you didn't think that the product was being manufactured fast enough and you didn't like the price. Well, um, I don't, I'm not convinced that comports with reality here. Consumers were not being charged the full cost of the drug and separate co-pays are not paid on inpatient drugs. Congress had already acted to protect uninsured patients from any cost related to COVID-19 treatments. In fact, Congress went a step further, increasing payments to hospitals that cared for COVID-19 patients. But this uh, policy that you're recommending also seems to me to betray a lack of understanding of the basic incentives and the science and how drugs are made. <clears throat> Gilead was in the process of finding other manufacturers at the time who could help them expand the production had there been uh, a significant increase in demand. Um, also, um, you disregarded the opinions of legal and scientific experts about this. Dr. Collins himself previously testified that NIH legal experts do not believe that the law allows the agency to intervene based on a drug's price, which was one of the reasons you cited. Here's what Dr. So uh, Collins said, and I quote, if you look at the language of the bill, it really intends to cover a circumstance where a drug is simply not available to the public under any circumstances and then NIH is entitled to step in. 
This is a little different when it's available, but at a high cost. Our legal experts don't feel that the law actually puts us in a position to step in, end quote. So, um, Mr. Becerra, I'm, I'm not convinced that you fully appreciate the downstream effects of socialist type policies such as those that you have advocated. Um, so let me just ask this. Do you, do, you, do you acknowledge that the administration does not actually have the legal authority to use marching rights as a mechanism to try to lower drug prices? Senator, first, thank you for the question. And great to have an opportunity to have dialogue with you again after years of serving together, including on the Super Committee. Um, what I will tell you is this, uh, if you, uh, you raise the subject of marching rights, the letter that uh, I was a part of was a bipartisan letter. Uh, uh, Attorney General Jeff Landry from Louisiana and I uh, put together that letter, and we had many, many attorneys general from both sides of the aisle who were part of that. And if you remember the, the date that you mentioned the letter was issued, that was at the time, if you recall, when we started to see the rapid increase in cases of COVID. And what we knew then, or what we know now, is far more than what we knew then. What we knew then was that many Americans were dying. And what we knew then was that remdesivir was a drug that was keeping people alive. And what we also knew then, and this was bipartisan, at least back in, at the state level, maybe folks here at the federal level had more information, but at the state level, we were seeing our folks die. And we knew that there was a drug that could keep them alive. Well, I'm run out of time. And, and I just have to say, we've got very different understandings of this history. Uh, there was not a shortage of remdesivir. Uh, there was not a problem with people who couldn't afford it because of other steps that Congress had taken. But there's a big problem when the government comes in and confiscates the intellectual property uh, that has led to a successful product. It creates a chilling effect and seriously discourages future investment. So I would. I'm running out of time here, but I, I would appreciate it and suggest you might want to reconsider whether uh, by the Buy Dole Act ever intended to act as a mechanism that would undermine the incentive for the private sector to deliver needed products. I thank, uh, thank my colleague. Uh, we have two senators who may join us um, momentarily, Mr. Inspector General. Um, but uh, Mr. Attorney General, and uh, what we're going to do is just uh, go through a couple of the formalities and see if they are going to arrive, and we should be able to wrap up. First, with respect uh, to members, I'd like to thank all members for their participation. I'd like to thank uh, Attorney General Becerra for a uh, very long afternoon. Regarding uh, questions for the record, the deadline for members to submit uh, questions will be Friday, uh, February 26th at 5 p.m., that 5 p.m. deadline is firm. We want to thank everyone for their cooperation. Um, I have a couple of other matters. Senator Crapo, anything that you need to add? No, thank you. Okay. Um, then moving very quickly, um, Mr. Attorney General, we wrote a law, bipartisan law, in this committee. I think I mentioned to, this to you briefly in our conversation. And it went into effect in 2018 to reflect the transformation of the Medicare program. The Medicare program, when I be, uh, began the Great Panthers in Oregon, we acknowledged that it was an acute care program. At part A, part B, if you broke your ankle, you went to the hospital. If you had a bad case of the flu, you went to the doctor. But it was acute care. That is not Medicare today. Today, is, Medicare is mostly chronic care. Cancer and diabetes and heart disease and strokes and the like. This committee wrote a bipartisan law. I consider it one of the most transformative health initiatives in many years. And the Trump people basically said it was a wonderful idea and never did anything about it in terms of moving it forward. My question to you is, um, when you're confirmed, and I will use that when you are uh, confirmed, um, will you assign several people of your staff to uh, work uh, with the bipartisan leadership on this uh, committee? As Senator Crapo and I have talked about these issues before with Senator Hatch and others, and we would like to uh, have a chance to work with you uh, after uh, the Senate votes on your confirmation. Senator, I look forward to that, and I can certainly uh, confirm that. Very good. One, one last uh, point, 
and that is at today's uh, hearing, it was clear there were stark differences of opinion when it comes to women's health care. And Mr. Attorney General, you have made it clear that you respect those differences. And I want to emphasize this point now. If confirmed, you will follow the law on women's health and all other issues that you will be responsible for as Health and Human Services Secretary. So given those commitments that you have made, uh, Mr. Attorney General, uh, today, in my view, the differences of opinion should not be used as a rationale to prevent confirmation of a person like yourself who is qualified. And I just wanted to set that out for um, the record. I want to make sure that Senator Hassan and Senator Portman aren't uh, waiting. I see no evidence that they are. And with that, uh, the Finance Committee is adjourned.